Okay. Um, hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number 44 of the John Riley Project. And today I'm so pleased to welcome as my guest, Michael Ryan. How are you? Hey, John. How you doing? So Michael and I, we've known each other for a number of years. Our, yeah. our children have kind of grown up in the, in the Poway area. Yep. And you're an author. And yeah. you were just telling me about your new book, The Heart of the Lion. And I thought, gee, you'd be a fantastic guest on the John Riley Project. So welcome. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. So um, you know, tell me a little bit more about the book that you've written and, and, and what, what motivated you to write it. Well, what motivated me to write this book was I had a, you know, a really bad <clears throat> um, football injury uh, October 2nd, 1986. And, you know, through, you know, through my life growing up as a kid, you know, sports was big. You know, when you grow up poor, you're trying to find a way out. And, you know... You need an outlet. Sure. And for me and a lot of my friends growing up, sports was that outlet. Yeah. So, you know, I trained hard, you know, just uh, started playing and, you know, had an injury and, you know, kind of crushed those dreams that I had of going forward with it. But, you know, it's it's not it wasn't the end for me. So I was able to move on and do other things. But just kind of give you a brief summary over that. But uh, yeah, it's about my life growing up in East San Diego. Uh, we call it they call it City Heights now. Okay. And going to school there and all my friends and, um, you know, just different things growing up as a kid, things that I've seen, you know, as a child, uh, things that I've learned, um, the people that rallied around me and helped raise me through the community. Mm -hmm. And Obviously, the, the football injury and life afterwards. So and where did you go to high school? I went to Hoover. Hoover? Hoover High. Okay, that's um, that's one of the longtime uh, old schools in San Diego, One of the right? very few, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah one of the starters. I mean, I, the, the rivalry, like, was it Hoover and San Diego High? Like the, Hoover, San Diego High, um, Lincoln and Crawford. But, yeah, Hoover and San Diego were pretty big yeah. uh, back in the day. Uh-huh. And probably still are. Right. And so, um, so you, you played football at Hoover. I did. Okay, so what position did you play? I was uh, offensive line and uh, outside linebacker. Okay. Linebacker, I, that was better suited for me because I was small, wasn't that big. You know, mm -hmm. the line was not the best position for me, but, you know, I was playing J JV at the time, so it didn't really matter. Linebacker was uh, my, my position. Right. Nice. So um, two-way player. Uh, yeah, three-way, actually. I was with special teams. Oh, you that's did? That's actually how I had the injury. We'll we'll touch on that later, I guess, okay. but that's how that happened. So this book is really more than just about football and, and the injury mm. you suffered, but it's really a, a little bit of a biography, right? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. You know, writing about your youth and some of the things you've experienced. Right. Um, so, you know, tell me some stories of um, what, what we can find in the book. Well, you're going to, you're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, you're going to read about um, my start where I was born. I was born here in San Diego. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, my mom and dad were married pretty young. My mom was really young when she got married to my father. She was 18. Actually, she was 17 and had me at 18. Um, my dad was, you know, about seven years older. Um, that marriage didn't last very long. It was mm -hmm. a very short-term marriage. Um, I spent a lot of time with my grandparents growing up as a kid. Um, spent most of my days, you know, just like any other kid, riding bikes, playing football out in the street, you know, playing baseball. Uh, just loved growing up as a kid. Um, you know, things weren't easy for us um, growing up. Lived in, you know, grew up poor, didn't have a whole lot of things. And if it wasn't for my grandparents, I wouldn't have had half the stuff that I had as a child growing up. But, you know, like a lot of kids, you know, you come from nothing and you have to work hard to get something. So and that's what it's all about. You know, you just put your nose to the grindstone and, and uh, build something from there. So, uh, you know, had a, had a really, I would say I had a great childhood, but I would be lying. Right. <laughs> it was a challenging childhood. Let's just sure, say, sure. to say the least. <laughs> um, I wouldn't change it where I grew up. I wouldn't change because where I grew up in East San Diego, um, you know, built who I am, you know, I was, I'm a firm believer that, um, you don't pick your neighborhood, your neighborhood picks you. Interesting. And the reason I say that is because if you don't fit in, if you don't belong, you know, you're not going to get much, you know, much love, I should say. That's the word I want to look for, from yeah. where you're growing up. Yeah. And where I grew up, you know, I was born and raised in those neighborhoods. You know, you just, I just gelled well with people around me. You know, I grew up in a multi-racial, cultural uh, upbringing, mm -hmm. which was pretty amazing for me because, um, you know, I was... 
I'm probably the more fair skin in my family, you know, <laughs> out of everybody. I, mean, I come from a, yeah. I come from Sicilian uh, roots. My mother's full blood Sicilian. Oh wow. Uh, my dad was Irish and Native American. My my real father was Irish and Native American. Um, he was a Vietnam vet. And one of the things that probably caused a lot of the issues with my parents' marriage at the time was, um, you know, my father almost died in the war. Oh wow. And uh, yeah, the story is in there about. Um, how he uh, left the mess hall one evening, said goodbye to all his friends, and the mess hall was bombed. Everybody in there died, and he almost died as well. He took a pretty hard hit from the blast and kind of messed him up. As a kid growing up, I never know much about my father. He was never really in the picture. All I knew is that he was, uh, you know, he was an alcoholic, and he was had a nervous breakdown in the military and. Well, I, now I know why, you know, I didn't know this until, um, towards the end when, um, you know, my father was about to pass away or he was sick and he was, uh, I didn't still didn't know this until he was in the hospital and they were giving him his last rites. I was about 22 years old. So the whole time I've talked to him on the phone as a child growing up, he never really wanted to talk about the war. Never really wanted to talk so about he his experience. opened up to you right near the end. No, it wasn't him. He was out. My his oldest brother, that side of the family I've never met growing up as a kid. My dad's side of the family. Really? And had a huge side. The Ryan side of the family is big. So my uncle Bob is the one that took me aside and sat me down when we were giving him his last rites and said, Well, I need to give you some information about your dad. And he's the one that told me, you know, about the war, about the kind of kid he was growing up. Well, actually, you know, the, uh, his sisters and uh, a lot of my female cousins on that side, you know, they touched on a lot of that stuff because my, my father was the second youngest. He was number, I think there were seven kids. I think he was six. And then my aunt was number seven. And my uncle Bob was the oldest and they were about 18 years apart. So my uncle Bob was coming home from war. My dad was going out. I forget how the story transpired on that one, but, uh, so, you know, he um, he had a lot of issues he didn't talk about, and I didn't very talk, I didn't talk to him a whole lot growing up once in a while, and every time I talked to him, he was at a bar. And, you know, we call it nowadays PTSD. Ah, uh, okay. Back when we okay. were kids growing yeah. up, it was yeah. like, it was like, oh, he came back, he was war crazy, you know? Right, right, the PTSD right. wasn't even the picture. PTSD is now famous for yeah, yeah. everything. Yeah. Everybody wants to use it for everything they have. Yeah. And, um, you know, unfortunately, I recognize it for people who have been in the military and, you know, went through a hard time, you know, what, yeah. what, from whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, he... Um, he had, did have a nervous breakdown. He was he was released. I believe it was a medical medical discharge from the military, due to the incident. I'm, I'm almost positive. And one of my I think it was my cousin, my oldest cousin. Um, I can't remember if I put it on Facebook or something, but we were talking, and she said that uh, he should have never been there. You, you're because my 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 cousin is the same age as my mother. You know, my uncle Bob his his daughter is same age as my mom. Oh, wow. Okay. So they're real close in age. Yeah, you know I mean, yeah. cause they were both about the same age. My yeah. mom, my dad married my mom. So like I said, my dad was second youngest and out of, out of seven kids or so. Right. And, uh, you know, so she would tell me some things too. And she said, you know, Michael, your father should have never been in that war because he just wasn't, he wasn't made for the military. He wasn't made for going to war and fighting, you know? Yeah, and I, I, and I he was, you. so, you know, I mean, so that's kind of what happened with that. And so I, I grew up pretty much most of my life without a father. Although my mom, my mother did remarry, um, when I was about four, four or five years old. And that was, that was a pretty rough relationship to say the least. So growing up as a kid in a poor environment and in, in, a, in an abusive environment was very difficult. I saw, you know, a lot of things that, you know, a child growing up shouldn't see. And, you know, obviously when you read the book, you'll be able to, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Um, my mom was remarried to my stepdad and, um, my stepdad, you know, my stepdad was Mexican. So I got, that's where a lot of my culture starts kicking in Yeah, because yeah. my dad, my dad was Irish and native American and my mom was full blood Sicilian. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of tempers there. Oh well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and I heard some stories, uh, uh, my grandmother, that was real close to my grandmother and my, my dad, my dad really liked my grandmother and would call her to get a hold of me. Um, I mean, they, my mom and him didn't get along. 
there was just no way. It's, my mom was an easy person to live with. I mean, it was just, it was turmoil with her. And and even till today, she's still with us. And it's like, you know, it's tough dealing with her some days. You know, she's just a strong, bullheaded, uh, you know, Sicilian woman, just speaks her mind and, and doesn't really care who cares what she says, you know? Right. Um, so, you know, so like, like I said, my, my parents were probably divorced inside a year. And I was you know, a little kid. I was just, you know, still, you know, probably about a year old, maybe not even a year old when they got divorced. And uh, so my mom remarried after a few years, she met, you know, um, my stepdad and that since they divorced probably several years, half a dozen years after that, but it was, it was pretty bad. It was, it was a rough relationship, you know, a lot of abuse going on and some pretty scary things happening growing up as a kid. So I had to deal with a lot of stuff as a child growing up. Um, and if it wasn't for, you know, like my aunt or my mother's sister or my grandparents, you know, I wouldn't have, you know, I would have probably been exposed to a little bit more of that stuff, but I got to stay with them. And, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, it was, it was tough. It was tough growing up in, in those neighborhoods and everything and dealing with, you know, broken family. And, uh, but you know what? It, it molded me who I wanted to be. I never wanted to be like my dad or my stepdad, or, you know, I wanted my kids to know that I was there for them, you know, the whole time, you know, I've been married for going on 24 years in July nice. and, and, you know, you know, my wife, Galit, you know, we've been together 28 years in June. So I don't plan on going anywhere and I don't plan on messing that up. So I we worked hard to make sure that we stay true to our relationship. I mean, obviously I'm kind of getting off of path a little bit, but just thought I had to throw that in there real yeah, quick. That's like, a, that's good. Um, but yeah, so, you know, my mom raised three boys on her own. I had two younger brothers. I have two younger brothers, two half brothers. They're mm-hmm. Mexican and Sicilian and they're hot headed boys, you know, <laughs> and, and they, they, you know, they, they're good. You know, they could, they're good with their hands. You know, they, they like to fight and they like to have fun and, and, you know, I love them to death. You know, I just, uh, they're, they're, they're a huge part of me. And, um, my middle brother was a, was a really great football player as well. He was the football player in the family. You know, I, I played football, but my brother was the athlete. You know, I had to work extra hard to get whatever I wanted. Uh, my brother was gifted with some really great genes and genetics, and uh, he was amazing to watch him out there playing. So that was a lot of fun when he was growing up. So like I said, my mom um, had, to, had to do it all by herself. And raising three boys wasn't easy because my brothers were built like me. <laughs> Big eaters, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 So that that was uh, that was tough keeping the refrigerator full. Yeah. And uh, but you know, we we made do with what we had. And so, you know, so if you don't mind going back no, no, a little go, bit. Go ahead. So um, your real father. Yes. D- did you have a relationship with him this whole time when you were young? No. So did he, he reentered your life kind of near the end of his yeah, life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he was remarried and, mm-hmm. and I have a half sister, uh, Molly and my two younger brothers are, uh, middle one's Efren and the, and the youngest one is Frank. Okay. And, um, I'm from that side from, uh, uh, but my, my dad remarried and I didn't meet my sister until she was probably, I'm guessing around late teens. Wow. And, and it was because, um, my father wanted us to get together. He was, I got together with my father at one point. I was talking to him as I was older. He came, he came to my high school graduation and that was the first time I'd seen him in years. He would come periodically once in a blue moon. Wow. Probably only saw him maybe twice before I graduated high school. Yeah. He came to the graduation. He didn't look good at all. You know, he'd been drinking for a lot of years. You know, he's dealing with a lot of stuff, yeah, some homelessness. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. He, he wow. lived on the streets for a bit, but through the, um, through the VA, he was able to get housing and stuff like yeah. that. But he came to my graduation, so I saw him there. And then a few years later, I think I was in my early 20s. And, uh, yeah, probably my early 20s. And me and Molly and my dad got together. She was in town. She was living in Tennessee. Mm-hmm. Uh, she went to go stay with her aunt there for many years. <clears throat> and uh, so she was in town. I think it was for her sister's wedding. And we got together with my dad. We met at, I think it was Islands in, in, uh, off of Balboa. So we met over there and we had dinner and we, we hung out and talked, caught up and everything. And, and you know, that's probably, that was the only time my sister and I and my dad ever sat down together. Wow. <clears throat> because then a year or two later he died. So, um, he, my dad was on dialysis towards the end. His, his, his kidneys were gone. Yeah. And he smoked, you know, and yeah. he was a little guy, little, little Irish guy, you know, <laughs> little Native American Irish guy. And, uh, um, 
you know, and I stand next to him I'm in my early twenties goes, man, you're big, you know, and I'm, I'm five, nine, but I'm, I'm wide, yeah, you know, yeah, I'm, yeah. My, I'm built like my, uh, my grandfather, Okay. my grandfather and all my uncles on his side were fishermen here in San Diego. Oh, well, right on. Okay. And yeah. they were built like brick crap houses. <laughs> I mean, I, if I could just throw yeah. that out there, they no, were, yeah. I, you know, I'm kind of keeping it kind of PG, kind of yeah. G level. <laughs> hey, there, there's, um, there's no ratings here. So you can say uh, whatever you want. Um, so it's all good. My grandfather was an amazing, powerful man. And my brothers and I are all built like that side. You know, we got that. My mom is, my mom's a big, a big Sicilian woman. So, um, so we all got that build. And, uh, so I'm standing next to my dad. My dad's, you know, a shrimp, you know, he's little, <laughs> he's like, wow, you're, you're, you're a big kid. I'm like, well, yeah, I was working out like crazy. And, you know, for a lot of years, cause when I got hurt, uh, I couldn't play contact sports anymore. So I got into bodybuilding, I got into lifting weights and, uh -huh. and I got into martial arts later on was not really the best idea when you've had a head injury playing ball, <laughs> yeah, 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 <laughs> but yeah. I did it anyway. So whatever, you know, I, I, I earned a black belt doing that. And, um, but you know, that's further along that, uh, but, uh, so yeah, you know, um, got to spend a little time with him, you know, and, um, and towards the end he was having issues I wanted to get back to where it was happening with him. Um, so he was having some issues. He was on dialysis, and he had emphysema because he smoked. And what t what actually finally took him down was he had had an aneurysm, hmm. and he was falling. My aunt, my aunt Ruby, um, who I got close with at the end, she was bringing me along and um, uh, said that he was falling down. And so they took him to the doctor, and everything. I guess they did a CAT scan. And realized he had he was having an aneurysm. Or I can't remember the whole story. I'm sure. I'm sure my family's going to chime in, tell me what what really went down because it was so long ago. Right. You know, it's like I think he died in ninety ninety three, uh, December ninety three, and when Gleet and I had just gotten engaged, or or we got engaged afterwards. I can't remember exactly. It was ninety two or ninety three, and um, so. You know, I, I thought about that at times when I had my injury, if that was, if it was uh, like a um, hereditary, if I got something from him, mm. you know, because what they thought, what they called it, some people said I had a, a you know, aneurysm. It was, it was a subdural, subdur, subdural hematoma. And that's okay. basically a, a vein that just, you know, burst when I got hit, you know, and uh, it's just from the impact. Wow. Lo and behold, the doctor said at the end of everything, my surgeon said it was basically a freak accident. So, um, but it does make you wonder. I mean, uh, knowing what your father went through, things that he suffered, and, yeah. and yeah, was it hereditary? Was it just the physical impact that you suffered? I guess we'd never really know. Well, um, did you, uh, did you want to touch on that, or you want to? You had you know, any more? You, did you want to touch more on the family life? <laughs> no, no. I mean, we're, we we just, I just want to just have a. Do you conversation. want to just kind of go all over the board? Just yeah, kind of have fun with it. But well, tell me about the injury. I mean, that's so, I'm intrigued about, to learn about that because I so, mean, because football injuries are a very topical thing in the news yeah. right now. Yeah. You know? So I was I was injured in '86, and nobody's talking football injuries in '86. You know. Um, so what happened was. We were playing against Claremont, and I was in the best shape of my life. That, oh, su that summer before, I, I was in 10th grade. The summer before, I was work, working really hard. I was lifting. I was running. I was running stairs, trying to get my speed and my strength up because I wanted to go to varsity. Yeah. I didn't make it. I didn't quite make the cut to varsity, but um, I was playing really hard. Um, As a sophomore. Yeah, I was but, playing really hard. Yeah, no shame in that. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, football, very competitive at Hoover. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you, if I had a little more speed, a little more size, it would have been a no-brainer. But mm -hmm. um, um, no pun intended on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, All right. All right. So, um, but that summer prior to the start of the football season, I was having a lot of headaches. And I wasn't sure if it was a sinus thing or whatever it was, but I was just having these headaches and I kept having these headaches. And I'm like, dang, what's going on? You know? And I never had those kind of headaches before. And I went to the doctor and he checked out and everything seemed to be fine. Um, I did take my physical prior to me playing and my blood pressure was elevated. And, you know, I'm 15 years old, you know, and the doctor was like, oh, your blood pressure's kind of high. He goes, but maybe you're just having some anxiety. So he gave me some anxiety pills or whatever, yeah. calm me down. Yeah. He goes, come back in a week. We'll text, we'll test you again. Make sure you're okay. Came back. Blood pressure was fine. It's like, okay, I'm going to sign you off. You know, no problem. And I asked him, I said, listen, I go, what would happen if I played football with high blood pressure? He goes, well, you can blow a blood vessel in your brain 
and be paralyzed from the neck down. And I was like, oh, man. But, you know, I love the sport. I wanted to play. Yeah. And, you know, against, you know, my mother's, you know, a mother's always concerned about her children. You know, she signed off. And, you know, I went and I trained all summer, trained really hard and got in the football came around and I was ready. And, um, you know, we started playing. We, we had some good scrimmage games. I was out there really active and, and you know, throwing some hits and tackles and things like that. You know, doing what you do when you play football, you know, and, and just having fun. Well, fourth game into the season, um, you know, that's when we played against Claremont. And, um, you know, I was on special teams. We were winning. The game was almost over. We had about eight minutes left of the game. And we were kicking off. We had just scored. Mm -hmm. And um, I was running down the field. I was on the far side, and I crossed in, and I was going to throw a hit on somebody. And instead of me throwing a hit on them, they crouched down when I got to them, and yeah. it drove his head into my chin Ooh. for the helmet. Ah. So you know, it just smashed me in the yeah. chin. Yeah. And, and uh, back then, I had a bike helmet, the company bike, you know? Yeah. So it had the, the pump cradle and everything inside right. there for the, for the crown. I had the best helmet. But the chin straps were this thin, oh, yeah. plasticky yeah, kind of yeah, thing, you yeah, know. Yeah. No protection. Right. So the helmet went right into it. Oh yeah. And and my head snapped back. I I stumbled back about five yards because of the impact. I was going pretty full speed, you I'll know. Bet. Yeah. Like hitting a brick wall. Yeah. And yeah. my head just was pounding, pounding badly. And um, um, yeah, I ran off to the sidelines. And I tell coach, I said, coach, I can't go out there. My head's killing me. Okay, okay, go sit down, go sit down, you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I had two coaches. Coach Stone was my head coach. Coach Diaz was my uh, was the assistant coach. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Coach Diaz was one I told because I was going to go on defense after that. So I I was not only I played both ways, but I also played on special teams too. Yeah, so and, you were on the field every yeah, play. Yeah, yeah. I was going to go after after that after. After that play would have ended, I would have ran back out there and gotten into my linebacker position and, yeah. and was, you know, finishing out the game. Yeah. But my head was just, I was just killing me. Oh, I've I'm never, sure. I've never felt anything like that in my life. And, um, you know, I'm walking, pacing the sidelines. I'm in this tremendous amount of pain. And, uh, you know, I'm telling Coach Diaz, Coach, um, my head's killing me. And, you know, um, you know, he goes, he looked at me and he was smiling. He goes, oh, it's just a concussion. Just a concussion, yeah. right? You know? <laughs> this is 1986, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and, yeah. and some of the players yeah. are kind of bickering a little yeah. bit, like kind of kind of joshing me a bit, yeah. kind of giggling a bit. Because they, they don't think anything. So they just think I'm overreacting. Yeah. And I'm, as I'm walking back and forth on the sideline, my left leg starts to fall asleep. Uh-oh. And the first thing that happened when my legs started going numb is what the doctor told me. Oh. And about being paralyzed. So about, you were like freaking out. I thought out. I blew a blood vessel, which actually I did. Yeah. I blew a vein. Uh -huh. And um, so I'm telling coach, I go, coach, I go, coach, my leg is falling asleep. My leg is falling. So the grin he had when he turned and looked at me and said, oh, it's just a concussion, turned to like, a look of like, oh my God, there's something really wrong here. Yeah, He's yeah. Like fear. Yeah. And he went and told you know Coach Stone, and and they sat me down, and there's there's really something wrong with me at this point. And I'm losing feeling on my left side. So how how many minutes is this after the hit? Oh man, probably within the first 10, 15 minutes, maybe yeah, maybe yeah. less. I, yeah. I I don't remember, but it's, it's it was really quick. Yeah. Put well, it was happening before the game ended, because like I said, there's about eight minutes left. I remember the time on the clock. Close to the time. It was like eight minutes and some change. Yeah. And so here I'm walking up and down, and, and this is happening. So the effects of the hemorrhage is putting pressure on my brain and causing the paralysis on the left side of the body. So I was probably on the right side. I guess the right side affects the left, kind of vice versa yeah, or whatever. something like something that. Something like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So it's – and I'm having these um, – I'm, I'm losing the left side of my body. And they sat oh. me down on the bench, and then they laid me down on the yeah. bench. Yeah. And they're – all the players are coming there. Everybody's scared at this point. So they're running over yeah. and they're trying to move me around, keep me moving, keep yeah. talking to me. They kept talking to me. My splur my uh, speech started to become slurred. And, you know, they were really freaking out at this point. And they got, they flagged down a fireman. A firefighter was in the area for some reason. This is what I was told. And Coach Stone was looking at me and he kept putting his hand over my eyes to check my, my pupils. Yeah. And he said, at one point I passed out. Well, he probably thought I passed out, but I was at a point to where I was hearing him and looking up, but I was unable to respond. I was in complete paralysis. Whoa. And that was freaky for like a short time. 
Uh, I was looking at him. He he's all, Mike, can you hear me? Mike, Mike, can you hear me? And and he's sitting there talking to me. And then I started to come around again. And I guess they brought a fireman over. They thought, you know, hey, there's going, what's going on? And he seems um, I'm responding, and some fire, firefighters like, oh, he looks okay. And then all of a sudden, my, I guess he said my eyes roll back and. And that's kind of when I stopped and I was like, okay, we need to get an ambulance here right away. Because back then for the JV games, they didn't have an ambulance. Wow. Varsity, they had an ambulance there. Anybody can get hurt at any time. Yeah, yeah. That's, Anybody. That's it doesn't crazy. matter if you're Pee Wee, if you're JV, varsity, you know, whatever. You should have some kind of medical staff there. Nowadays, they do more yeah, often yeah. in high schools right, nowadays, right. you know. But back then, it was like, nah, who's going to get hurt? You know, at 14, 15 years old, you didn't think you're going to get hurt like that. Right. Um, so finally got the ambulance there and I'm still slurring and, and they pull my pads off me and my Jersey and everything. And, uh, they throw, they get me on the gurney. And, um, the last thing I yelled to coach stone and this was big for coach stone, you know, because, you know, it's almost wrecked his career. I mean, emotionally. Yeah, and, yeah, um, yeah. and he was a, you know, he was a great, both of them were great coaches, coach Diaz and coach stone. And, um, I yelled over to coach and said, coach, coach. And he said, he said, yeah, Mike, I said, can I have my jersey? I should have brought my jersey. I still have it. You do, really? I still have it. What yeah. number were you? 50. 50. Yeah, it was white jersey with the cardinal red. Oh, nice. And uh, I said, Coach, can I have my jersey? And the jersey, you know, I don't know what it was. And maybe ask any football player. But for some, something about that jersey that just meant something to you. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I it's understand. Like, yeah. Here's um, your school colors. Yeah. It's, you take pride in that number. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, they, they, yanked, they were yanking. I watched them. And I was inside, inside the ambulance. And I can, they're yanking. Get Mike's jersey. They're yanking, they're yanking the jersey off the pads. Nice. And Coach Stone grabs it and he throws it in. He goes, and and uh, I knew they were going to come after that. But I, yeah. they rushed me to the hospital. I went to. Uh, luckily, I was in Claremont, so they rushed me to Scripps Memorial in okay. in La Jolla. Right. And it was luck, luck of the draw on that one because I had one of the best surgeons around. You know, one of the best. Uh, you know. Um, uh, cranial surgeons and um, I'm drawing a blank on what their <laughs> what their real name is. You know, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, uh, you know, just uh, I, I'm I'm sorry. I'm drawing a blank That's okay. on. But they're like the doctors that work on you know the head, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, the head. <laughs> but it sounds kind of funny because they're yeah. there's um, drawing a blank. I'm sure somebody's gonna post up what they are. Dude, they're neurologists. Neuro. Okay. <laughs> okay. So they're probably going, dude, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. Um, well, but anyways, it's not a game show, so we're okay. <laughs> yeah, man. They, they, so they had me in there. They got a hold of my mom and and my best friend. I was also I had just also started dating somebody in high school. And um, so it was like, you know, they were supposed my best friend, David, who's also in the book. You'll read the book and you'll see him in there. Um, and my girlfriend at the time, Gina, uh, they were supposed to both come to the game. They were supposed to get a ride. Uh, but Gina's brother was supposed to take them all and, and go for, for some reason. They couldn't find the football field. I guess Claremont High School's football field was tough to find or whatever. Yeah. And, and I was glad they didn't come. Because that would have been horrible for them to see that. Oh, to see you taken off on a gurney and a yeah. you know ambulance. And yeah, then, yeah, yeah. That was that was rough. That was a rough go. And yeah. uh, but my mom made it to the hospital, and David she she brought David with her. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if my grandmother took her or whatever, but um, so I'm laying there in bed, and they took me in for a CAT scan before anybody showed up, and they saw that I had a hemorrhage, and they needed to take me into surgery, and. Um, and I, yeah, I didn't know. I was, I was in bad shape, and I was like, you know, at this point, I don't. Yeah, I didn't really. I was scared, but I, I almost, almost didn't care because you're, you're, you're in pain, but you're, 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 you're numb and you're slurred, and you just don't. You, I was cognitive to what was going on around me, but I wasn't really. I don't know. I was upset that I got hurt. I think. Yeah. And it was, it was sad for me, you know. So. Well, yeah. And. uh so, you know, my mom comes in, she's obviously visibly upset, you know, and I tell her, hey, and, you know, and, and she didn't know I had a girlfriend at the time. <laughs> my, mom, my, mom was, my mom was really yeah. strict. And you got to yeah. understand something. If yeah. I can back up just for a minute. Yeah. My mom became a Jehovah's Witness when I was, she became baptized when I was about 11 years old, but she got into her religion at, when I was about eight. So I was raised in that religion. Okay. And we'll touch on some of that stuff that it was, it was pretty, pretty nasty going forward. But, um. Um, so, you know, so that, that was, that was one of those things where, you know, she didn't want me dating. Plus my mom was strict anyway. So it wouldn't really matter what religion she is. She yeah. didn't want me dating, but I was, yeah. I had a girlfriend. And, uh, so I gave her, I said, I have a girlfriend. 
And I said, here's her number. And she wrote down that I remember the number. I was I wasn't out. I was I was I was I was yeah. totally functioning. And because I started getting feeling back in my body. So it was a temporary, it was like a temporary process from yeah. the hemorrhage, but I still had a slurred speech. Gave her the phone number. And as soon as, you know, David, my buddy David called her, you know, and uh, because I was getting ready to go into surgery and I, you know, I wanted her to know. Yeah. Um, Doctor told my mom, yeah, he's got a hemorrhage. We have to take him in right away. We have to do surgery. We have to stop the bleeding. And uh, they got me in there and, you know, I didn't know what was going on. You know, I remember them taking me in on the gurney and they stripped the rest of my clothes off of me. Oh, yeah. You know, they probably cut them, you know, they pull. I felt I felt to pull my pants. I had the yeah. pants with the pads and you know, the football pants, yeah. pull them all off of me. Underwear yeah. and everything was all yeah. off. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm like, <laughs> I'm laying here. I'm going, oh, you guys are stripping me down. You know, I got like nurses and doctors around me. And yeah. I'm going, oh, are you serious? It, yeah. I remember it being cold and a lot of bright lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like this, yeah. you know, it's like, yeah. but it was, I'm laying there. I'm going, oh, <laughs> and then the guy comes over me, this big black mask. And I remember looking up at this guy and he has his piercing blue eyes eyes and he had the you know all the you know the the head i mean the, yeah. the cover on his head yeah. and the mask and i'm looking at him like this and and uh and he looks at me and they put this big black mask over my face boom i'm out yeah oh yeah that happens quick yeah i'm out and and then i i wake up and um after what was a six hour surgery six hours yeah they had to stop the hemorrhage and the hemorrhage they weren't able to stop it and uh I was, you know, I remember waking up in the in the recovery room and just big old head bandaged tubes and everything on me and stuff like so that. So where where on your head was it? Do you remember? Oh, it's back here. I have a scar that runs from the bottom part of my neck all the way at the back of my head and back down this way. Really? And yeah, they had to go in from the neck and cut under the base of the skull because it wasn't like the base of the skull. They had to, so they took out that bone, and they had to get to the hemorrhage and they had to try to stop it. Wow. And um, so that was, I mean, underneath the skull, right? Uh, you had to cut the skull away to get to it. Oh my God! It was it was one of my sinus veins. You have a few sinus veins that grow up the back of your head mm-hmm. or up back of your brain or wherever it was at. Um, and I think it was outside the brain. I think there's like there's like a covering that goes over the brain to protect it. Yeah. I think it was outside that part. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't. I, I forget. So it wasn't actually on the brain, but it was yeah. on the outside. Pushing against the brain. Uh, yeah, that makes the sense. Hemorrhage. So they had to cut the bone away and get in there. And so what? I guess what they had, what ha- after everything was all said and done, I guess what they did was end up packing the vein away. They couldn't, they couldn't, they had to seal it off completely. They couldn't oh, stitch wow. it or close it up. They just packed it away. Yeah. And I guess they, 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 back then you could use gels and they probably still use them today to seal off, you know, arteries or veins or whatever it is they need it for. And because they couldn't stop it and they kept coming out and telling my mom, you know, we don't think he's going to make it. Whoa. Yeah, we, we, he's got a slim chance. Whoa. You know, I kept coming out, and the, the coaches were there. You know, at this time, you know, my girlfriend was there, and my best friend was there, and my my grand, you know, my grandmother was there. My grandfather, my grandfather passed, passed away when I was ten years old, and that was a big blow to the family. So my grandmother had to be the rock, and you know, my dad wasn't in the picture. My stepdad wasn't in the picture. You know, nobody was there. Um, but I had step cousins on, on the you know the Mexican side of my family, and they were a big part of that too. They were always I, I still hung out and grew up with them, and mm-hmm. you know even though my stepdad and my mom were, were split up, um, they were still big parts. So I think some of them showed up, and uh, but <clears throat> um, I know all my side that side of the family was there. My uncle came, you know my my mom's brother, my aunt, everybody was there. Um, so it was it was pretty nasty, and you know, the doctor kept coming out, you know. You know, so we're, we're doing like, everything we can. It's just an, an injury, just an innocent injury in a JV football game. And mm-hmm. you are like literally on the edge yeah. of losing your life. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It was, it was pretty bad. You know, I, I challenge anybody to, you know, <laughs> to even tell me that, oh, I don't believe that. Well, I'll, I'll turn around and show you my scars. Yeah. It just like that. I mean, I've got, you know, I had, I was trached, you know, I've got, I've got surgeries on my gut from just that one hit. I had about a, over a dozen surgeries, major surgeries from one hit. Well, you obviously went in the hospital that one evening and right. they, you know, they did the, the surgery behind your skull, but then there were subsequent surgeries like yeah. afterwards? Yeah, so what happened was I had a half a dozen or more surgeries on my head. Yeah. I kept having complications. Well, yeah, because the bleeding wouldn't stop. Well, that plus they put a shunt in my head to drain spinal fluid. Because when you have a head injury, a lot of times you'll end, end up with spinal fluid, like kind of getting a blister or something. They have to drain it. Yeah. Well, it's inside your cranium, so or inside your, your skull. So they have to drain that somehow. A lot of head injury patients, um, 
end up with if they have surgery or something invasive, they put a shunt in your head so it drains spinal fluid and they anchor it through your neck into your belly. It just drains it into your gut. Yeah. And well, they did that with me and uh, I was having issues with it. Uh, what it did was it caused me to have uh, an infection in my stomach. Oh my God. So my stomach was distended. It's distended naturally now because I like to eat, you know, <laughs> but, um, um, but, uh, but it was extent, it, it was extended and, and it was, it was painful cause it was just out here and I was, I had internal bleeding going on. I had some sickness, I had, I had this infection going on. It was really nasty. It just, it was, it, the fluid was infected. So not only was I going in and out of surgery from, from my head, <clears throat> but now I have to deal with this. And this is where the whole religious thing comes in. This is where the whole, cause I had to have a blood transfusion. Oh, okay. Here we go. Yeah. So this is where it gets kind of, you know, kind of hard. Yeah. And so the doctors are telling my mom, you know, he needs a blood transfusion. His blood count is really low. He's got a major infection. He's going to die if we don't give it to him for the surgery. And my mom's like, no, he's not having any blood. I'm, I'm a witness. He can't have any blood. We don't, we don't believe in that. So, and, you know, my girlfriend, her mom, you know, they're very Catholic. Yeah. My, my grandmother, obviously, because yeah, yeah, she's yeah. a Sicilian, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, very, very Catholic. Catholic, very religious. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my, everybody, I hear this frantic, I'm really sick. At this point, I had, I had the trach, uh -huh. <clears throat> couldn't speak. Um, I had a paralyzed left eye. I couldn't turn it out. I was double vision. I was sick. I was, I couldn't talk. I belly out to here. This was all the surgeries I had, was having was in the first couple of weeks I was in the hospital. And I can hear this frantic yelling and arguing in the hallway going on about this whole thing. And I see the nurse coming in frantic, just going back and forth. They're just freaking out because my mother won't give them consent to do the blood transfusion because my blood count was really low. And so I'm sitting here laying in bed and I'm actually aggravated. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm, yeah. here I am 15 years old. You know, I, I lost in my dream. I'm sick. I'm, I'm dying. And people are fighting over, you know, what to do with me. And I'm thinking this isn't, this shouldn't even be your choice, you know, yeah, but, I, but yeah. I couldn't communicate very well. And the doctor. But you were fully aware. Of what's I was going fully aware. I, I've been fully aware since the injury happened. Um, I just kept closing my eyes in the hospital, waking up in different rooms, which meant I had different surgeries. Every time I closed my eyes and went to sleep, I'd wake up in another room. Because they were knocking you out. Because they kept knocking me out yeah. or because I was I was passing out or because yeah. I was having complications. Um, I mean, I have a scar here from drainage. I have a scar here from a temporary shunt. They had to pull the shunt out of my head. So when they did the stomach surgery, they had to take the shunt out too because it was killing. It was not going to help me. So that's when they put the temporary one over here. I'll explain all that in a minute. But uh, so the doctor's coming in and he sits next to my bedside. And he's going, Michael, he said, listen, he goes, your blood count's really low. He goes, you're very sick. He goes, we can't do the surgery unless we have some blood. We got to give you some blood to make you to get you ready for the surgery. And, you know, my mom's just like, no, he's not. No, we don't want him to have it. This and that and the other. And my grandma, I can hear my grandmother. You know that, excuse me. <laughs> that was difficult. Sorry. That's okay. No, this is this is big. So, you know, the doctor was like, you know, we gotta give it to you. And I was like, okay. I said, do it. And I mean, because I was mouthing the words, you know, and yeah, and, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, he thought, okay, we're gonna do it. And my mom came in, she was all upset. She's all, you know, you know, Michael, why'd you, why'd you say yes to it? You know, you, don't you think Jehovah's going to save you? And I was like, at this point, I wanted to get out of the hospital. I wanted to get back to school. Yeah. You know, I you wanted to. Like a normal life, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I wanted to, you know, be with my friends, you know, yeah. do all kinds of stuff. And I knew that, you know, 
I was going to take a chance at not waking up again. Well, yeah. After everything I'd already gone through. So, you know, my mom was upset, you know, don't you think Jehovah's going to save you? And I was like, I can't take that risk. At 15 years old, I was already ahead of my time as far as where my maturity was, as far as what I wanted in life, what I, what I wanted. Yeah. And, and part of that's already gone. So I knew that I was like, you know what? I'm not going to take any chances. I, I don't like to take a lot of unnecessary chances or not unnecessary risks if I don't have to. Right. And I was just like, you know what? Let's just do it. I told the doctor, this was in 86, October of 86. You know, they started testing blood for AIDS back in June or July of 86. Oh, wow. That's when AIDS was kicking yeah, in. Yeah, you know? yeah, that's right. And uh, I was like, I kept telling him, test the blood, test the uh, blood, yeah, test okay, the blood. Good for you. And so I was aware. I was very aware of what's going on yeah. in the world. Yeah. And he goes, we tested the blood. The blood's good. We have to give it to you. And, you know, that's when I said, okay. Bottom line is I was a minor. And regardless of religious beliefs, the doctors would have ended up going and getting a court order to make it happen anyways. Right. And, um, you know, there's really nothing my mom could do. I felt bad for my mom. But also that's where a lot of my 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 uh, animosity and anger was coming from after that, after my recovery, you know, towards my mother was that, you know, when you read the book, you see a lot of different things in there about how I had a lot of reactions to her and why I have animosity to her the, to this day. I had to I had to forgive some years back when she got sick. We almost lost her. Yeah. And we had to come to some kind of common ground. And and uh, I let some of that go. But obviously, it still bothers me to this day. But, you know, it's it's difficult when. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, I felt bad for her because she was the odd person out. Yeah, you know, not nobody believed in what she believed in, and because of this one person de determining the fate of her own child, you know, that's like, you know, you're supposed to protect your children. I would never do that to any of my kids, and you know, we went through with Tommy, and yeah, with, with Tommy yeah. had surgery and stuff like that. Yeah. We almost lost him when he was little. Yeah, you know, it wasn't. I mean, it was like reliving what my mom, my family relived with me when wow. when, my, when my son was sick. Yeah, I would never put my child at an unnecessary risk. Why would yeah. you risk that? Those doctors weren't probably equipped. See, my mom believed that there was a doctor in um, Norwalk, up by Long Beach area, mm -hmm. that worked on witnesses with no blood. Well, he was very good at it. But these doctors here, even though they were one of the best that you can get there in La Jolla, they weren't equipped with, I guess, the same. I mean, they could use blood replacements, but they weren't like, I don't think they were as good at that as this doctor was specifically good at because he worked on witnesses all the time. Well, it's like it's like performing a surgery with, as a disadvantage, right? You know, you like with one arm tied behind your back. There, maybe there's a guy up in Norwalk that specialized in it. Yeah. But the the, the surgeons in La Jolla were probably, you know, world-class surgeons. But yeah. They assume they're going to have all the resources available to do it the right way. So I'm curious. when So you're 15. Right. Now you're a minor. Mm -hmm. So were you were able to choose for yourself and or did your mother have, a, you know, legal authority to make that choice? Or did the doctors just say you said yes and they went with what you said? I think they. I think that's kind of what they went with. They were gonna, like I said, I think they were gonna get a court order regardless because I was a minor, and that as a minor, I think the medical staff had a obligation to save me regardless of what the outcome, what what the parents yeah. say. You know, that makes because sense. Because you're putting a child at risk at this point, and if I was 18, and my mom was my only beneficiary or my mom was the only person who had control over me or whatever it was the, was my next of kin then she probably could have made those choices and I would have been kind of stuck with it if I was incompatible if I was not coherent or anything mm -hmm. like that my mother would have made those choices right and if I didn't have anybody if I wasn't married or anything like that she would have been the next person to make my final the, the final decisions on whatever I would have needed and uh but you know I mean I'm sure I get called out on that maybe I was maybe I'm wrong but I, I doubt I'm wrong I've been telling the story for 32 years, yeah. 32 and a half years or yeah. whatever. Yeah. And and I know that, um, well, I made the decision. I was like, yes, let's do it. Yeah. And the doctor's like, you know, like I said, the doctor said, okay. Right. On. And that's when we did it. We went in, um, I was in surgery. They, they cleaned it all out. And um, I don't know if they did the cranial surgery at the same time to remove the shunt, but they went in and removed the shunt at some point. Cause I was just an absolute mess from, 
head to belly. I was just uncomfortable. I had surgeries all over the place. I had tubes coming out of my body. Like I said, the trach, it was, it was, it was bad for, for, for weeks. I was in ICU for a month. A month in ICU? Yeah. So in the hospital for <clears throat> longer than that then? Two months in the hospital. I, wow. I did a month at Scripps and did almost a month over at uh, Sharp Rehabilitation. I still go there with, I belong to a brain injury awareness uh, group called Gray Matters. Oh, wow. And so we meet there. I, I don't meet as much as I'd like to because they meet on, on Tuesday nights, the first Tuesday of every month. And I got to get up early the next day for price changes or whatever, because yeah, yeah. what I do for work. Yeah. And so I got to get up at 2 a.m. So, oh, I don't, yeah, so I don't get to go to a lot of these meetings. I also belong to a car, a car club that meets the first Tuesday of every month. So uh -huh. I pick and choose. Yeah. You yeah. know, I don't get to go to these things. But uh, I, when I do, they meet up at Sharp. And it brings back all those memories of my oh, recovery. Yeah, yeah, I, I see, still see these, this, the floor scale. When you walk into the rehab center, the floor scale is there because yeah. I was a skinny, I was a rail. I lost all my muscle, all my weight, and oh, I was yeah. I had to build it all back up. Yeah, I remember walking down the hallways when I was recovering and or on my walker or on my wheelchair because I was I had no muscle in my legs. Yeah. I was in a wheelchair yeah. for a yeah. while. I get up on there and weigh, they weigh me to make sure I was putting on weight because I was got my appetite back. It took me... I think by the third week I was in, after all my surgeries were done, finally, going into the like the third week or so, they started pulling stuff off of me because I started recovering. Yeah. I was out of the woods, but it yeah. took a couple weeks to get me out of those woods. Oh, yeah. And uh, um, I had staples all over my head, all over my head. I was wearing a beanie. I didn't get the staples taken out of my head until I think I was in rehab. I think it was I think I had them in my head for about a I don't know, at least a few weeks. Maybe I got them out before I left for rehab. I, I don't remember that part. Um, but I did have a, I was all stapled up everywhere. Gut was stapled up, you know, and uh, wow, that was, it was a mess. It was hard to sleep because I couldn't sleep on my back because I had staples on my head. I couldn't sleep on my belly yeah. because I had staples on my stomach. So, <laughs> and I, you know, I, be, I was, you know, I have a, I have a, a scar here for my neck where they anchored, I think the shunt. And uh, yeah, it was, I was, I was a complete mess. I had heart monitors, Everything you could think of, I was I was strapped to it, you know, catheter, and the the, the worst part of everything was that tracheotomy. Oh. Was the trach because I couldn't talk, you know. Obviously, you've known me for a lot of years. I, I enjoy a conversation. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of people that know me right now that are on that are that are looking in or chiming in will know. Yeah, he's a talker, and um, that was the hardest part because I couldn't communicate that well what I was thinking or what I was doing. I had to try to write everything down, and I had double vision at the time because my eye was still paralyzed, and it was hard for me to write. And I was just just so so ill, you know, that I was just trying to get by, and. Um, but, you know, I I was very lucky, you know, people were looking out for me, a lot of positive thoughts, and I was able to get through that, you wow. know. And you're 15 years old going through this. Mm hmm Jeez. Life on the edge. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And it's interesting how, I mean, there's so many aspects to this, but like within the context of football injuries today, you know, now everyone's very hypersensitive, very right. aware. Um Back then, you know, like, oh, yeah, you got your bell rung. There was no concussion protocols no, like yeah, there is now. nothing like that. I mean, like you said. Like, yeah, your bell rung. Exactly yeah, right. They yeah. would just sort of smirk and, yeah, you know, shake it off, you mm -hmm. know, rub some dirt on it. Exactly. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, but <clears throat> uh, you know so much more now. Mm -hmm. um, thank goodness. Uh, but there's been a lot of people that have really suffered, you know? I mean, from these kinds of injuries. I mean, Junior like, Seau. Yeah, he's the Junior, classic. Junior Seau. He died on my birthday. He did. May 2nd, yeah. Wow. He died on my birthday. I was a big junior fan. Um, so a funny story, my sophomore year, uh, when I was injured and I was recovering, I was wearing a beanie and I was yeah, wearing sweats. Yeah. I was all skinny and everything. My cousins from my stepdad's side of the family, um, well, junior was a senior at Oceanside. That actually makes sense. And, yeah, and, yeah. And Because junior's two years older than I am. Yeah. And junior was a senior at Oceanside. And Hoover, the varsity, our, our varsity went to the playoffs. First time in many years mm -hmm. against Oceanside. Uh, Got their butts kicked. Yeah. Okay. They said Junior was a phenom. Yeah. You know, he played different positions. He was, I don't know, he played all kinds of positions. He was just killing them out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, what, I was going to go that game. And even though I was still recovering, uh, uh, my cousins were going to 
take me to the game if I wanted to go. But I think something, it was just late and my mom decided probably wasn't probably a good idea for me to be out there late like that. It would have been very (sighs) soon after being released, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was, I think I was on outpatient. So at Sharp, I was inpatient for a while. And then I started, because I was recovering so fast that they started putting me on outpatient. I was able to go home on the weekends, you know, spend time with my family, my brothers, my mom, my my grandmother and all that stuff and, um, and all my friends. But I had to be back at the hospital Sunday night, I think it was. And uh, I was in a wheelchair for the first first time I was released to go home. I was still in a wheelchair. My legs weren't strong enough just yet. I was still working on some things. I was able to walk around the house and everything. But if, if I was going to go anywhere long period of time, I was going to have to be in the wheelchair. Um, so I didn't get to go to that game. And that's okay, you know. And uh, uh, But I did go to... Uh, our last game of the season against Crawford. Really? Wow. Yeah. So, so you must have gotten hurt like in one of the first games of the year. Fourth, fourth game. Okay. And we played ten games. Okay. You know, so I got hurt fourth. You know, fourth game of the season. And you know, the thing was, is I was I was a captain on the team. You know, I was one of the leaders, mm-hmm. and you know, I was a starter and all that stuff like that. So, um, so the last game of the season was against Crawford, and we played at Crawford. My mom graduated from Crawford, and my wife graduated from Crawford. My wife and I graduated same year. So we're class of 89. She graduated from Crawford. I graduated from Hoover, you know, mm-hmm. one of our rivals. Um, but my mom went ahead and called the school and asked if I could come out to watch the game, be on the sidelines. I was barely, I was still, I was walking with a walker, but I had the wheelchair too. And what happened was I, you know, I was trying to walk with a walker. And I was on the gravel. Um, so they opened up the gate, the principal and everybody let yeah. me in. My mom pulled her car in. Yeah. And uh, um, I was on my side of the field, obviously, and uh, with my team. I ended up just being in the wheelchair and some of the players were pushing me around and nice. stuff, and, yeah. and uh, which was pretty cool. That was that was special for me. And uh, so we came away with the win. You know, Coach Stone came up to me, you know, and uh, Coach Stone was a big guy, you yeah, know, yeah. wrestler, you know, okay. fo- fo- okay. you know like wrestler. He was an yeah. amazing wrestler. He, he, would, he, he trained some really good wrestlers out of that school. <clears throat> um, okay, all came up to me. All the cheerleaders came around to me afterwards and asking how I'm doing. All my players, all my boys came up to me. And that was fun for me. And, you know, nothing was more special to me, though. I was I was almost recovered. Uh, I was wearing a hat, you know, covering my bald head because I saw the scars. I oh, wanted yeah, to cover it yeah, up in my yeah. hair. But um, we had the, the uh, banquet. And um, I happened to get there early. I think I, I don't know. If, I think my mom dropped me. Yeah, my mom got there and I was with my buddy or somebody. We walked into the coach's office and I saw Coach Stone and all the coaches in there. And they're like, Mike, hey. They didn't think I was going to be there. Yeah, yeah. And I kind of surprised them. Good. And uh, so it was kind of cool because at the banquet, they were handing out the awards and everything. And then, you know, Coach Stone got up and, you know, I apologize if I get emotional again. But <laughs> um, he says, you know, we have one last award. And he called me up. And when I got up to him, I walked up to him, I thought I was just going to get a certificate, you know. Yeah. He pulled out the varsity letter. Oh. And, you know, he says, you know, you know we're going to miss him. He pulled out the varsity letter and I was like. Wow, I because that was everything. You wanted to earn your varsity letter yeah. when you're a kid. You that's that was your first step. Yeah, go varsity. I want yeah. to earn that letter. Yeah, you know? that's right. You know, and I was never going to do that playing football again, and I was never going to have that opportunity, and because I lost all that. But that gave me a little bit of juice back. You yeah. know that yeah. that seeing that letter come out of that envelope was yeah. like, I didn't know how to react. I was overcome with emotion. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, and uh, I was like, wow. I, I wanted. I should at the time. I should have hug my coaches, you know, and just well, thank the, you. Thank you. Yeah. But I think they saw the look on my face and I went back and sat down and I was just like, man, I couldn't believe I had this. And so I got a jacket. They, they, what they did was they put together a fundraiser for me and I said, they saved up all this money. And I took that money. I bought my first Letterman jacket nice. and I say my first Letterman jacket because I was still really skinny when I went and got fitted for it. Uh-huh. And, and, uh, I had the Letterman jacket and so this was all in like December. So I I got hurt October second. I was released from the hospital completely at around towards <laughs> towards the end of November, December, mm-hmm. and uh, so I was home. And I went end up going back to school in February. I had a tutor, and uh, but that that banquet got me going, you know. And uh, so I was ready to come back, and um, so I get back to school, 
hair's growing back, muscles are coming back in because I was starting to, I was lifting. Oh, wow. And my legs were starting to come back, but I was still, I didn't have a lot of energy. I was still working yeah, on that. Yeah, yeah. I was, I walked to school from, from my house. I walked to Hoover from where I lived. It was probably a few miles. <clears throat> I don't remember how many miles from my house, my old house, but it was probably about three, four miles or something like that. And I remember going up there to visit. And then when I came home from school, I crashed. I was out. Oh, um, yeah. I, I was out. Completely out. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, but I got back to school. My tutor got me ready. I had a tutor. She got me all squared away. And then Valentine's Day of 87, I was got so sick in my gut. Oh, no. And I was I was throwing up. I was in a lot of pain. I was doubled over in pain. I started feeling some pains like a couple weeks so prior. So this is lingering from the injury, right? So Yeah. So what happened was, because I had the stomach surgery, remember? Yeah. yeah. And uh, so what happened was scar tissue built up and wrapped around my intestine. Oh, my God. And it was perforating. So I had to, I, I was, I, I remember eating a bowl of cereal that night. As soon as I ate that bowl of cereal, my stomach just like somebody was squeezing my insides. And I was like so much pain. I couldn't, I couldn't take it. I ended up <clears throat> sleeping with my mom in her bed. I was so double over in pain. I didn't want to be by myself in my room, yeah. I guess. Wow. And my mom was like, well, we're going to take you into the doctor first thing in the morning. And, you know, which, you know, I wanted her, you know, she was kind of, kind of keeping an eye on me and stuff. So I went to the same family doctor that I went to go see for my physical or whatever. And he knew about my injury afterwards and all that stuff. And he goes, you know what? I think you got something going on with some scar tissue or something in your stomach. You need to get down to Mercy right away. <clears throat> so my mom took you down to Mercy Hospital. Excuse me. Um, and lo and behold, I had, you know, I had, I had this blockage. They get in there and they found the scar tissue. I had to have two stomach procedures while I was there because <clears throat> they didn't get everything on the first round. So they got what they could out, but I was still having issues. And when they closed me up and everything, so the doctor's like, you know, this guy was really cool. Uh, his name was Dr. Leo Murphy. Okay. <laughs> and I was born at Mercy. All right. And uh, so this guy was really cool. He'd come in, pat me on the shoulder, shake my hand. I saw I was wearing my Letterman jacket and all this stuff. I actually got it when I was in the hospital. That was the, the, the thing I forgot to say was um, when I got my Letterman jacket, because I was fitted for it, I think my grandmother or somebody got it and brought it to me in the hospital. I was wearing it in the hospital and stuff. And he'd come in, he'd pat yeah. me on the shoulder. And he goes, you know, he goes, you have a lot of muscle in your stomach. He goes, I had to cut through a lot of muscle to get to what I need to get to, you know. Right. And he was just blowing me up a little bit, you yeah, know. Cool. Yeah. But I had to have another surgery because I was still having complications. So he went in and goes, he went in there, cleaned house, took care of business. They ended up taking some, a little bit of intestine out because yeah. it was, you know, it was bad. And, and he goes, yeah, he goes, he goes, Michael, we, we had to go in there again. He goes, and we cleaned house on this one. He goes, you should be fine from here on out. And I was, I was good. And, um, but yeah, I had all kinds of tubes coming out of my stomach, staples all over again. You know, it was a mess. Um, but that knocked me down. I, when I, when I first got injured playing football, I weighed 154 pounds. I got down to 122 pounds inside of a couple of weeks. Oh yeah, I lost like 32 pounds, and I got my weight back up because I was where I was hovering. Mm -hmm. So when I got sick again in February, I lost uh, about 18 pounds, and so it wasn't that bad on this one. So I knew I was going to recover that one really quick, <laughs> and uh, uh, but yeah, so I I just went back to the drawing board. Once I got once I recovered, I was in the hospital for two more weeks. Uh, once I got out of there. Um, I started working out again and building myself up, just getting ready for whatever. Um, my main goal was to build my body um, so strong that if I ever got sick again or got hurt again or something, I can recover from it. And I didn't stop working out for years. Um, so, <clears throat> well, how? Let me ask this: You got injured on October second of eighty six. Yep, my how? grandmother's birthday. Actually, matter of fact, it was really? my grandmother's birthday. She was out there with my uncle. Wow! And when she got the call, wow. So October 2nd, 86, how long did it take until you felt normal again? And, I mean, that months, I mean, maybe even a year. I think I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I ever really felt hundred percent normal after that. Um, my speed was gone. Uh, I never regained my speed. I mean, I, I was, I was, I wasn't real fast, but I was quick kind of deal. And yeah. I was, and my speed was improving. Mm -hmm. But once I got hurt playing football, I never regained that. I don't know what it was. Well, you lost a lot of muscle. I mean, yeah, but I was able to build all that back, but I never really built my speed back. It's like one of those things where just you lose a step. Yeah. You know, from something like that. Yeah. And um, um, 
the only sport I could play was track. I mean, the only sport I could, could uh, compete in was track, and I threw the discus because I, I wasn't really fast, and uh, you know, to run to run any events, um, uh, the sure sec wasn't fast after that, and uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, but to answer your question, I think I felt really good. I think the summer or going into my 11th grade year, I was feeling a lot better. I was stronger. Um, I felt good. That's like physically <clears throat> feeling normal. Yeah. How about mentally feeling normal? Emotionally, I was a mess. Yeah. You know, because, uh, you know, what really broke me down was, uh, you know, Gina and I splitting up. And uh, that was, that was, you know, Gina was my first love, you know, yeah, she was one yeah, of, yeah. In, in high school, you know, she was real, she was there for the whole entire thing, yeah, the whole thing and through my recovery, through everything. And then when you split up, it was, it was, it was hurtful. It took me a long time to recover from that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, and we remained friends afterwards kind of deal, but it was tough, you know, I had to move on from that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you know, it set the path for whatever else was going on, you know, it, things worked out. Things worked out the way they were supposed to work out in my life. Okay, good. Exactly the way they're supposed to work yeah. out. Um, so I have no regrets on that. You know, it's it, it built me who I am. It made me who I am and built my character the way it is. And um, so that was pretty devastating to me. It was more devastating to me than being in that hospital bed. You know, and I, and I thought, you know, at the time. Well, first gr first girlfriends are <laughs> first, yeah, yeah, yeah real. Yeah, I mean, it's like that, that's tough, man. Yeah, I mean, I everybody's you. gone through that. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So you, you you go through those before you find your ultimate person. Your, yeah, your, yeah, your person, your partner. And I found that. You know, it, it took me some years, but I, I found her. Like, so I got hurt when I was fifteen. And I found Galit when I was twenty. So. Five years, you know, later, I, I found the one I was going to marry and yeah. be with. So it worked out. So I couldn't be happier. Um, so we split up, and then um, the summer I was training and getting back into shape, and you know, I went just entering my eleventh grade year. And did, did you ever have any thoughts of going back to football? Oh yeah, every day. I mean, but, but I mean, was it a realistic option? No, or? it wasn't realistic because okay. I even asked my coach. See, Coach Johnson, he was my athletic director. He was the head coach, varsity yeah. head coach, and I even asked him one time because. He was there, talked to my mom. He even told my mom straight out, he's never playing football again. And I even asked Coach. I said, hey, Coach, do you think I can maybe put the uniform on but just not play? He goes, nope. <laughs> no, Ryan. He goes, you can't. He goes, you, nope, not putting on the uniform. And I'm yeah. like, oh. So I was a gopher for the last two years. I wanted to be around the game, so I was just a team manager. Yeah. Water bottles, yeah. that kind of stuff. And for somebody who played – that's very hard to swallow. I had to swallow my pride an awful lot. I'll bet. Because I wanted to be around the game. In hindsight, if I could go back to do it again, I wouldn't have done that to myself. You know, I wanted to be around the game, but I could have been around the game from the stands. Yeah. You know what I mean? I didn't yeah. have to. I didn't have to be on the sidelines feeling embarrassed because I couldn't play, and I'm running. I'm running balls of waters out to guys that I'm just as strong as, or yeah. you know, just yeah. you know, yeah. I still feel like I could still play the game. Yeah. But I knew in my mind that I couldn't because if right. I took another hit, who knows? And uh, so I, I was a wrest I wrestled to a ninth grade, but wrestling was out. Yeah. And so the only thing I could do was track, and um, you know what? I had fun doing that, and. You know, I was in the gym every day working out, had fun doing that. I just really had a fascination for lifting weights. I really enjoyed that because I felt strong. And uh, I did that for the next couple of years. And, uh, you know, I went through different relationships through high school, different couple of relationships. Every year I had a girlfriend and, they, and for some reason it didn't work out. And um, had a girlfriend in 11th grade, you know, a real pretty Mexican girl I dated for a while. Her name was Laura. Um and, you know, that didn't work out and, uh, which, you know, that's fine. And things work out for a reason. And, uh, then I, um, you know, dated somebody in, in my senior year, Roxanne, um, that, you know, like I said, that didn't last too long. That was several months. And I think things were just working out that way for a reason. And we were supposed to go to prom my senior year and this, this, you know, Roxanne and I, and, and it didn't work out. You know, we split up and ended up going with my best friends to this day. And uh, I mean, her name is Stephanie, and and she was actually maid of honor at our wedding. She was a Galit's awesome. maid of honor, and you know, she's like my sister. Her family, her mother is. Her mother was there for my last surgery, and my last surgery. So fast forward through senior year, uh, I graduate. I graduate on time. You yeah. know, I got through school. I, I struggled eleventh grade. Struggled. I couldn't even get a two to save my life. I don't know what it was. I was, well, I was. You missed some valuable time in the tenth grade. I did, but I, I stayed up because I got the tutoring I needed, yeah. and I stayed up, yeah. and I actually did okay. But once eleventh grade hit, eleventh grade is hard for most kids, even till today. It is. Yeah. Tommy had a struggle with it, and most kids I know struggle with eleventh grade. It's just yeah. tough. Yeah, it is. Um, 
I struggled big time because all the hard classes were in 11th grade. They are. That's and true. it killed me. And so I had to go to summer school. Mm-hmm. And I did okay. I finished summer school and got my senior year and made sure my load wasn't too heavy. It was just enough to get me guys where I get good grades and, you know, graduate. And I did. I, you know, I had mostly electives, but I had a couple of the regular classes, English and history or whatever it was probably that I had. Math, I didn't have to worry about math. And that was, wasn't was my strong point. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, so... Um, Senior year was awesome, you know. I mean, yeah, I had a relationship and split up, and that was tough. But it wasn't nearly as tough as the first one or the second one. That, that those were kind of hard ones. And then, and then, uh, you know, you know, Stephanie and I went to prom together. That was awesome. I had a blast. You know, I, I, I still talk with her mom on about that stuff to to this day. Her mother and I are really, really close. You know, um, I, we we go there to her house for different events throughout the year. My wife and I. She loves my, she loves my wife because Stephanie and her were friends in junior high school. I didn't know this. They, they, they lost their friendship a while because Glee went to different schools. Oh, wow. Stephanie went to Wilson with me. Okay. And I didn't know Stephanie. I knew her, knew of her, but I didn't know her. I knew Stephanie through Gina, my first girlfriend in high school. Oh, wow. That's how I met Stephanie. So th- this is all interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's funny. I'm yeah. kind of bouncing around a yeah. bit. So when I was dating Gina, Stephanie was her friend. And that's how I got to know Stephanie. We weren't real close, but we knew yeah. each other. Yeah. And then um, after all this, after all this happened in eleventh grade, I got to become friends with Stephanie. And then you know I was dating different people. So you know, and then in, in um, my senior year, you know, we were still like we got even closer. We were still friends, but I was dating somebody. Yeah, yeah. And then um, you know, uh, I uh, you know we, we went to the prom together. But, you know and. I couldn't have picked a better person to go to the prom with. We had a great time. And her mother just loved me. I'm, I'm, I'm to this day, I'm her son. We had a situation, we had an incident at her house. I was there with my family and we were at her house, you know, um, Stephanie's mom, Sandy. And, and, um, uh, had an incident where some guy was trying to come into their yard or whatever. It's a little long story short. They called the police, uh, her husband, Charles, who I, I think he's, I think of as my father. He's just a, a wonderful man. He just sits there and talks to me and, you know, he'll, he'll give me his point of views and it's, he's like the father I never had. And, uh, and, um, it's, it's, they're, they're just an amazing couple. Cops came over and they were talking to her and, and I was standing there and uh, they were asking me, and, and, and she said, this is my son. <laughs> and and that was really special because she has two daughters. She didn't have any boys, you know, has bo- grandkids that are boys, you know, but but she treated me like a son. That's just how much I, I meant to her. And she means a lot to me as well because um, she was there for me. You know, I got to know her in high school and uh, we did all the senior stuff at her house, you know, and uh, hung out with them. And obviously I took Stephanie to the prom and she was real proud and everything. And, and my best friend, David. Um, you know, we all, we went together, you know, the four mm-hmm. of us in, mm-hmm. in his date. I had a great time my senior year. After all that mess I went through, my senior year was just amazing. And I had a lot of fun, met a lot of new people. I'm, I'm real, I'm a social butterfly, I kind of say. I don't, yeah, yeah. I don't know the male yeah. version of social, how yeah. to say that to yeah. sound yeah. tough. No, I'm not here to be tough. I'm, I'm too yeah. old for that now. I know you know. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had such a great time. And, um, you know, Something sparked up between Steph and I, and and uh, but you know what? It, it didn't work out. You know, it was one of those things where I was like, you know, I care about you a lot. You're one of my best friends, and we're gonna keep it at that. I think you know, yeah. let's just let's just keep the friendship because I don't want anything to ruin that. Yeah. And it, 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 like I said, another thing, it worked. It worked out for a reason. Yeah. You know, she's still like a sister to me. Yeah. I love her to death, mm-hmm. and uh, she's my my wife. You know, Galit loves her. We we love each. We're we're, we're like a family. That's great. And, and that's the way it should be. And yeah. And and then you know we just were best friends. And then I met Galit two years later. And it was funny because, um, you know, I, well, after, well, after high school, after our prom, after prom, then we, we graduated. And the following Monday after graduation, I had one last surgery. Oh, wow. I, I had to have, Still. I had, I had to have a plate put in the back of my head to cover the sauce. They remember I told you they, they released hey, the yeah. crane, they cut the bone out. Yeah. Well, they never replaced it. Oh, they didn't? No. Nowadays, now, because I was so sick, they weren't, they didn't want a chance putting a plate in there yeah. and keep, when they knew they were going to probably have to keep going back in yeah. there. Um, nowadays, they take the bone and they'll stick it in your belly, keep it alive. Really? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? And then they put it back in they like, can a, put puzzle, it back like in, a puzzle it's, piece? It's factory equipment, put factory equipment right back in there. You know what I mean? Um, so, so uh, do you have a metal plate in the back? It's plastic. Of your 
plastic. It's plastic, yeah, it's plastic. They got away from that metal stuff years and years ago. Okay. You know, that was that was way back. Um, so yeah, they they kind of shaped it, you know, and um, they just they popped it back there because this was a non-emergency surgery. So yeah. the same surgeon, uh, Doctor Copeland, Brian Copeland. Yeah. Um, he was amazing. He came in. He did the surgery at Sharp, and uh, just I was he had it done. I was in there for a couple hours. They fixed me up, and I was out of the hospital in a few days. And uh, uh, two weeks later, I was back at the gym. You know, they took the staples out. I was I was doing my thing a couple weeks later because I was healthy. I was fit as a horse. I mean, mm-hmm. by the time I graduated, uh-huh. I was, you know, I was buff and I was yeah. strong and yeah. I was lean. I was healthy. I was ready for this. I knew I was going to do this. I just didn't want to do it in my 11th or 12th, uh, 12th grade year because I didn't want anything to happen to me to cause any kind of problems so I wouldn't graduate. Yeah. I didn't want to die or, 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 you know, the worst case scenario yeah, yeah, yeah. or, or be in a vegetated state because of meningitis or, or something, you know, something yeah. were to happen. Yeah. I was like, you know what? I'm doing this after I graduate. I want to enjoy the rest of high school. You know, I want to, I want to be with my friends. You know, I want to do all the things I'm supposed to do in high school, go to dances, uh-huh. go to games, do all this stuff, you know, and have a good time. And that's what I did. And, um, you know, and growing up in, in where I grew up, there was a lot of bad stuff going on around there and the drugs got real bad. Mm-hmm. You know, crack cocaine got real bad back in the eighties. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a matter of fact, when I got home from mercy, after I had the stomach surgeries, <laughs> I went to go visit a buddy. Of mine. I grew up, I, I grew up on Marlboro Avenue and Van Dyke just South of, uh, university Avenue. Okay. And so I was finished up living in East San Diego. I finished off on Van Dyke Avenue. I went down to a buddy of mine's house, uh, somewhere down off of, uh, Myrtle Street, I think it was, and uh, right around, or maybe 42nd Street, uh, I was at Buddy's house. I was coming home, and here I'm recovering from the last two stomach surgeries yeah. I had. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm walking, I still, I'm, I'm stitched up, and I'm walking down the street, going back home, and all of a sudden I see these two kids, two Hispanic kids, run against the gate. They slam up against this gate, and they pop the gate up, and they're running up the street. And then I see these Two two black kids walking up, yeah, yeah, and they come out, yeah. and and you know, because I'm in a I'm in a predominantly I'm in a mixed neighborhood, yeah, yeah, definitely. you know what I mean, definitely yeah, yeah, in a mixed yeah. mixed neighborhood. Yeah. But these two guys came out and they walked into the light from the, from the apartments. Yeah, guy had a gun sitting right here, and I'm walking in front of this yeah. guy. I'm thinking, I just got out of the hospital, man. <laughs> Am I gonna get shot now too? I go, you know, I'm like, come on, yeah, man. Yeah. But they didn't mess with me because I wasn't, you know, I I did I wasn't I wasn't you know I was just I. Put my head down, just walked straight. My house was right here. Just walked up. They didn't mess with me. They just they were looking for those kids yeah. that they were going after. Right. And I was like, so that's what we had to deal with in, in that neighborhood at times. But you know what? Yeah, yeah, there was a lot of that stuff going on. And um, but it it made me who I am, you know what I mean? Because I grew up with these people. You know, they're they're amazing. You know, there's a lot of people that gave me culture. Yeah, the, yeah, there was there was a lot of bad that comes along with that, but it doesn't mean that you can't walk down Poway Road uh, and somebody can't have a gun out there and do yeah. stuff because we just had something. There's good and bad in every neighborhood. every, every neighborhood yeah, there's yeah, stairs. Yeah. Guys, I, and but you know what? It's like I said, I I enjoy the foods that I eat, that I enjoy, the the music I listen to, the yeah. people I socialize well, it's a great with. Experience. It, it's yeah. it's it's a wonderful experience, and um, you know, for a kid like me to grow up in those neighborhoods and be protected and taken care of. By, you know, you know, it wasn't a common. You'd see me with a bunch of, you know, you know, older black guys or something like that walking around the neighborhood and hanging out with them because I knew these guys since we were kids or whatever, or yeah, yeah. you know, um, and and or some Mexican kids because my cousins, my step cousins were yeah. Mexican. Yeah. So yeah. I was always hanging out with them. We were always out there playing football all day long. That's what it was all about. Yeah. I was brought up understanding and learning culture. Way before it became mainstream nowadays where people are getting into stuff where it's like so culturally accepted. Well, I yeah. was already being raised in that. Yeah, so you lived this whole notion of uh, diversity, right? And diversity, exactly. <laughs> and it was it was beautiful because yeah. so many of my friends who are probably chiming in the Facebook are, you know, I hope they're proud to see that, you know, I'm doing this right now. Yeah. You know, a lot of my friends, yeah. you know, from the neighborhood, from the high school, you know, that I really hope that they appreciate me getting out there and talking about it because, you know, nobody really knew our neighborhoods like we did. And, you know, it's one of the things to go to, to go to Hoover High School, the only high school on the Elkhorn, on Elkhorn Boulevard. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. when you got truck dealers yeah. and you got hookers and you got cars with sound systems <laughs> beat, booming yeah. down and down while you're in class, you know, yeah. you're sitting in class and your head's just kind of, <laughs> kind of rocking while you're in class, you know right, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. 
I mean, I, I really, despite all the bad things that could have happened in those neighborhoods, there was a lot of good things that came out of oh, it. Of course, yeah. And, and what people don't, you know, people don't realize is there's so many stereotypes out there. I'm like, well, you know what? Have you had a chance to actually live in those neighborhoods yeah. or or grow up with those people or um or or make friends with those people and let them kind of give you an educational tool, you know, about what it is to to grow up in, in a di- diverse area? It's a beautiful thing, man. So um, cuz you get to know people as individuals, right? Yeah. And and rather than looking at the stereotype of, you know, the color of their skin, their socioeconomic. You look at each pe- person by, based on their mm-hmm. character. Yeah. And you probably were surrounded by great people. You know, I was given lessons that you can't you can't buy from a book. You know, you can't get from a book. Yeah, I believe you. And, you know, even now that next month I'll be 48 years old, I'm still learning. You know, oh, I'm still course. learning. I'm, yeah. I'm still learning. Me too. I'm still learning who I am as, you know, Mike, you know, yes. what, what kind of person am I yes. and what kind of legacy am I going to leave behind? Yeah. And, you know, I'm hoping that this is part of that and people can appreciate the message that I have. You know, it's like, listen, I went through a rough time in my life growing up. It's not as rough as some other people that are out there. There's people worse off than me, you know, and there's people that are far better. Yeah. yeah and, but yeah. you know what? I'm, I'm living this really great life that didn't come easy. No. It still doesn't come easy. I still got, I still have a job to go to every single day. That's right. You know, I started in the grocery industry um, after my 11th grade year. I started working at 17 and I've been in it for, you know, over 30 years. Right. And yeah, it's not the most glamorous job in the world, but the message behind all this is, Okay, you've known me for many years. Yeah. You know that I have a pretty decent life. And, yeah. You know, um, my wife and I do pretty okay. Yeah. Um, I got a son in college, you know, and yeah. he's doing well. Um, you know, I live in a great neighborhood, you know, it, mm-hmm. but, but none of that stuff was given. It was all earned. Yes, it was. You know, uh, my wife and I worked very hard mm-hmm. um, to, to build the lifestyle that we had. It's a life that I didn't think I was ever going to have. You know, going through what I went through. I mean, I I could have been, I could have gotten to drugs. I could have joined a gang. I could have got shot that night. You know, I could have, <laughs> or, or I could have, I could have died in that hospital, and and all those things that you know that could have didn't happen. The things that I planned for did happen. I had goals, and what a lot of kids growing up in those neighborhoods, what what I actually got to see, what a lot of people who didn't grow up in those neighborhoods don't see is. I had goals to do something, get out of the neighborhood and do something with myself. Yeah. And I, and I made, yeah. I made goals and did that. Mm-hmm. But a lot of kids I grew up with didn't have those same goals. That's right. Yeah. They, I, I lost some friends in those neighborhoods, you know, a lot of friends, you know, I mean, if I could sit down and talk to you about the kids that have passed away in the last five years in their forties, for whatever reason, it, it's heartbreaking. But some of the kids that I grew up with who were shot or who, you know, went to jail, you know, for, selling drugs or, you know, being in gangs, kids that were great athletes that had all this potential, had all this God given talent Mm -hmm. and wasted it on drugs and alcohol and, and partying or, you know, doing other things. It's skipping school, dropping out. You know, it was just, it was very depressing at Mm -hmm. times. You're looking at this, I go, I don't have half the talent you have. And I would kill to, maybe I shouldn't say that, but I would give anything to, be where you're at and you're just, you know, throwing it down the toilet. Yeah. You're flushing it. Yeah. I'm going, why would you do that, man? You know? And I'm just like, you know, and I'm sure later on in life, as, as we've gotten older, they've come to realize, well, man, you know, I just, I pissed away all these, the years of my youth. I could have gotten a scholarship or I could have, I could have been a businessman. I could have been making all this money because yeah. I was smart enough, you yeah. know, or I was, yeah. I was, I was good enough, mm-hmm. you know? I'm like, yeah, you were good enough. But you didn't see that. Now you're you're much older, and you know I'm not saying you can't still spark up something in your life. But I guess some people it takes them um, being bounced up a little bit, being bounced around a little bit, being smacked around a little bit with life by life to realize that you know this is what I should be doing. I shouldn't be doing this. This is what I need to be doing. And that message is hard to get to some kids when they're young, yeah, because yeah. they just want to do what they want to do. Right. That's how you learn. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's people at my age or young, about right around my age or in their forties that still live at home or that are, are struggling because they did whatever they want to do. And they didn't have, they didn't want to listen to anybody when they were growing up. There was a lot of older people in the area that were grown that, you know, were lived that lifestyle that would talk to you. Hey man, don't, don't, don't go down this way. 
You know, don't go drinking and partying. You're 15, 16, 17 years old. Don't start smoking that dope or don't do don't join a gang. It's the stupidest thing you could probably do, you know, mm-hmm. in their opinions. Cause mm-hmm. we'd have guys come talk to us at school and you know, you the messages, you learn from those messages, you pick up a piece of that. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I hope someday that somebody will get a piece of my message and go, you know, I once heard this guy who grew up in where I grew up, he grew up in City Heights. He went to Hoover. You know, this he had this happen to him. He grew up around this environment. He grew up around a very abusive, violent environment mm-hmm. as a child. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I saw some pretty bad stuff, John, growing up. And stuff that a five and a half year old kid shouldn't be seeing yeah, growing up. I, I believe you. You know, and I gotta tell you, from what we from where I began to where I'm at right now. You know, my wife would sit there and say to me, and, you know, she would say, you know, I don't know how you turned out the way you did. And I'm not perfect by any means. You talk to Galit and she'll tell you, <laughs> he's he's an asshole sometimes, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and and people I work with, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a lover. You know, I am. I have a yeah, big heart, I you, think. You do. But I battle, I battle, you know, and it's for someone who's not religious, I use, uh, sometimes I use some religious puns. You know, I battle, yeah. I battle the Cain and Abel syndrome. Yeah. A lot. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of us do that. You so know, you, what do you mean by that? So Cain was good. Yeah. He was the good son. Yeah. And Abel was the evil son who mm-hmm. killed Abel. Right. Okay. So you look at that because my mom raised me, you know, we're, we're religious. And of course you pick up some things on the way, yeah. which resonated with me. So there's a good part and a bad part to everybody. Yeah, of there's course. There's a yin and yang, you yeah, know? Yeah. And you want the good part to win, but you're battling the bad part every day because the bad part is wanting to talk you into doing things oh. that are get you in trouble every time. Yeah, yeah. We've all been there. Yeah. Oh, don't touch the stove. Yeah. It's hot. What did, what did I do? And I did this. Psh, ah, you know what I mean? <laughs> it's like that scene in Animal House where like there's an angel and the devil on the shoulder. And uh, yeah, you, you can talk yourself into doing crazy things. We all have that. Oh, no you know? doubt. No we doubt. all have that. And it's, it's good because it, it's like that you know, the old saying, you listen to the voice in your head. Well, sometimes that voice is telling you, huh, jump. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jump in the deep end. You'll be fine, you know? <clears throat> but uh, I, I'm i I'm truly, uh, I, I guess the word would be, I mean, if you're religious, and there's a lot of religious people out there that I know, if you're, if, I guess I'm truly blessed. I have this wonderful wife. I have these wonderful kids. I have this wonderful life. You have a great family, fantastic family. I, you know, it, 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 I don't know. Somebody set a path for me, and I'm just thankful. I had but, people like. But I, maybe you set the path yourself. I did. You know what? I think I, I. It was in my mind that I wanted, and I do believe in positive affirmations. I do believe in when you put your mind in a positive direction, or when you set goals for yourself. Yeah. Those. Doors will open for you they will. if if you stay on that path. It's true. It's mm-hmm. so easy to divert. Oh, no doubt. And you know, if I can, if I could kind of touch on what what brain injury people go through, brain injury survivors go through every day. Mm-hmm. I've been at the last couple of years. I've been kind of using these analogies for what brain injury survivors deal with. So, brain injury survivors deal with a lot of different issues, um, and a lot of them tend to be emotional. You know, uh, for for a while there, for when I was a kid, I was going through. I dealt with some depression, dealt with anger issues. I still deal with anger issues. You know, you know, uh, agitated really easily, mm-hmm. and that could be also because I'm getting older now too. Well, I've been like that my whole life. You talk to you talk to my wife; she'll tell you he's been like that since I met him. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. And uh, but our thought process. So the way I explain how a brazier survivor thinks, coming from me, in yeah. my opinion, yeah how we process things. So the way my mind processes things at times, because that's why we tend to be so exhausted at the end of the day, because our mind's constantly working yeah. harder, yes. you know, to, to get the message across inside here. Yeah. So you have 10 doors. Okay. So the average person can run up to that door with a single key, boom, open the door, run through the next one, boom, open the door, run through the next one. Just one key. Brain injury survivors have those same 10 doors, and they have a ring of like 100 keys. Oh. So you run up to that door, and you're going, 
you're searching for that key. You're searching for that key until you finally find that key to open the door. And then you go to the next one. By that time, that guy's sitting there, he's sipping a tea and he's hanging out, uh -huh. waiting for you to come into, into, into through door number 10. So, but, but in, in a real life situation, that means what? Like what, your decision making it's process a little times, bit slower? For, for me, it's sometimes, depending on what it is, whether it's work related, sometimes it takes me a minute to step back and process what okay. I'm dealing with. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's the average person has to deal with that as well. But that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it, you I, think your decisions <clears throat> through rather than rushing through doors. Tend to overthink things sometimes. Well, yeah, and some, I, I do that a ton. <laughs> and and sometimes, you know, I'm, some memory issues, there's just that. Yeah. You know, I had a, I like to believe I had a 100% complete recovery, but I didn't because once you've had an injury like that, you're never the yeah, same. You're not Sleeping gonna, is an issue. Yeah, and yeah. that's one of the things that people don't understand about brain injuries, if I could touch on that for a minute, is when a person has a brain injury, it's an internal thing. Yeah, it looks great on the outside, but what's going on, on the inside? It's one of those silent epidemics that people don't really understand is that, you know, just because you look fine on the outside doesn't mean you're not dealing with turmoil on the inside. Well, it's like what Junior Seau was dealing with, yeah. what Aaron Hernandez had dealt yeah. with, and yeah. what he, how he acted out. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's heavy. It's going to have a huge effect on your life. Yeah, I, I worry that I'm going to have some issues at a younger age, you know, um, early Alzheimer's. You know, uh, Junior had CTE. And you know it's, was it, it's uh, chronic traumatic encep encephalopathy or something like that. Yeah, I'm it's sure. it's CT. Look it up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's all I can tell you. I can't pronounce the last word right now. Um, and that's what he had. And they when they examined his brain after he killed himself, um, they found that his brain was badly damaged. Yeah. And for that man to be functioning the way he was been functioning, outside of the game and everything, I mean, just getting by daily would it's, it's a miracle. He was probably fighting internally. <clears throat> we don't even know. He was he was yeah. battling he was yeah. battling so badly he was just yeah. so damaged from yeah. playing twenty plus years he played twenty years in the league and he played high school, you know twenty four plus maybe even even Pop Warner I don't know, you know but you start thinking about things like that and you start taking you start taking your your health a little more seriously. Well, is football really worth it? You know what? Listen, if you ask me right now, would I put that helmet on and go back on that football field? I would tell you, hell yeah, I'd be out there. <laughs> but as a father. And as somebody who went through that, I got parents all the time, you know, because I work in the grocery industry. I, yeah. I meet people every day. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and I had a mom reach out to me. She's probably going to see this. <clears throat> I had a mom reach out to me about her son playing football. And I love this kid. He was a little, I watched him since before he was, before, when she got, we found out she was pregnant with him. And, you know, you get to know the customers. I used to take him when he was a toddler and he used to come up to me and, Ask me if he can hang, you know, hang out with me while I was working. I'd put him, take him on my cart, and I put him on my cart, and I'd w carefully wheel him over. Nice. He's asked me if he could work with me. <laughs> right on. Okay. And he's my buddy, but this this kid is, wants to play football, mm -hmm. and she called me up and she she wanted to talk to me about it. And as a parent and as somebody who went through that injury, um, she wanted to get my side of it. And I said, listen, uh, and I and I and I don't want to misquote anything, but I gave her my side, how I felt about it. I said, you know. As a parent, part of me wants to say, no, don't let him play. But also, I was torn between giving her a solid answer. That's another thing. I, I have a hard time giving committed answers to anything. And I'm, I'm sitting there telling him, listen, I love the game. I love the game. I would play tomorrow if I could. Um, that broke me when I, when I couldn't play anymore. And it's just a, in some people's minds, it's just a stupid sport. You have your whole life to live. Why would you want to play that? But for some people, it's everything. For some people, you know, life, doing something in life that means so, so much to you is everything. And when it's taken away from you, mm -hmm. it, it's it's disaster, you know? I mean, what if you wanted to be a doctor, a surgeon, and you lost your hand in an accident? Yeah. I mean, I'm just giving, that's just an analogy. I just came up with it's something that or, I came with right play now. A, you want to be a, a, play a pianist. The piano. Um, or anything. I mean, yeah, people get dedicated to certain things that they love and it has great meaning in their life. Yeah. You know, I, I, I told her, I gave her honest answers. I said, listen, you know what? If he really, really wants to play, you should probably let him play. Let him play. Let him practice at least. Yeah. What, what do you got to lose? Can, you, can he get injured? Yes. Could he get injured from a kid hitting him or getting hit in the head by a ball out in the out in the playground or something? Or could he get hit by a car? All that's possible. Of course, our lives aren't guaranteed. No, they're not. No. I mean. And there's risk everywhere. Every day you have risk. Yeah. Every day you have risk. So mm -hmm. why live your life worried about what's going to happen 
why not live your life worried about what you could be? You know, I, I, I don't, I don't, you know, you, you can't, you can't dwell on, oh my God, this could happen to me. <laughs> Look, no. man, I, I never thought in my wildest dreams I'd be the situation I was well, in. Well, fear is, I mean, I hate to use the word paralyzed, but fear yeah. can paralyze right. you, you yeah. know, and it prevents you from living that life that you really dream of. Yeah. Um, this, you know, I, when we started this conversation, I didn't realize we were going to get to this level of this is really <laughs> good what we're talking about, because I thought we were really going to just talk about football and the brain injury and, and which is a huge issue. Yeah. But we're getting into another area. Like one of the things I talk about a lot on this podcast is, you know, the theme of it is about life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Mm-hmm. And the, everything that I believe about life is, is about living your life, you know, um, uh, taking control of your life, having goals, mm-hmm. you know, aspiring to something rather than just sort of drifting through life. Yeah. Cause a lot of people drift, mm-hmm. you know, but, you know, having, having goals, putting your, building a plan and achieving, um, you've done that, you know, even despite the huge setbacks in your childhood, the huge setbacks from your injury, you kept fighting mm-hmm. you and you know the name of your book heart of a lion i mean you 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 have that heart you have that drive it's inspirational this this is huge so you know where i got that from where okay so and i appreciate that thank you that, yeah. that means a lot to hear that from you uh by the way and uh because it took me a long time to appreciate that for years, my wife was trying to instill that in, into me, you know, for years, she finally just gave up because I tend, I tend to be negative or grouchy at times, you know, and, <laughs> but she said, you know what, look at everything you have, you yeah, know, yeah. you have so much. Yes. And that was her way of saying that, you know, you know, I mean, I should be appreciating her because she allowed, she gave, she helped build this with me and we, we did this together. She was my angel, you know, and she's she, very special. Person. She, she's very, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's hard to think of, you know, life without your, she's my partner. So oh, yeah, she no made doubt. this happen. And what my life wouldn't be the way it is without her. So, oh, I mean, yeah. I, I'd be living a life, but it wouldn't be nearly as, as amazing as it is. And I, I thank her for that. Every, you know, in my mind, I thank her for that. And, and, and she needs to know that. So, um, cause she is a big part of all this. So, so where the heart of the lion came from is, um, my mom's maiden name is Cordelioni. Really? It's yeah. almost almost like the Godfather it's name. It's spelled it's the uh, see the Godfather spell it was Corleone without yeah. the D, uh-huh. but I think they started using Cordelioni later on. Okay. Uh, in, in the movies like, they started using with they started using the D. And uh um my great grandfather was adopted just like and my great grandfather's name was Vito. <laughs> That is perfect. I swear, I swear, I swear to you, I can't, I can't make this up. Um, my great grandfather's name was Vito Cordelioni. Yeah. And my great grandma's name was Maria. And uh, so everybody in my family is Maria or 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 uh, Benny. I have my uncle, my mom's brother's Benny, and then I have cousins that are Joe Benny or Benny Joe. And then a lot of Marias running around. My aunt, my mom's sister is Maria. You know, uh-huh. my mom is the only odd person out. Her name is Angela. So yeah, you know, it's a totally different name. Um, but. Uh, so Cordelioni means the heart of the lion. Really? Cor, you know, De, De, De Leone, Leone, the lion. Ah, heart of the lion. Okay, that heart makes sense. Lion. So I, I, um, one, of the, one of my favorite movies as a kid growing up was I was, I was a big Rocky fan. You oh, know, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and I, I loved Rocky. I love you know I loved Sylvester Stallone those movies. You know, and The Godfather. Yeah, that was raised on all that stuff. But you know, I was a Van Dam fan too. You know, I like Van Dam and oh, the yeah. martial arts, all that. Yeah. Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, and then he did that movie Lionheart. You know, and and I I thought I was just kind of stuck with me over the years. And and then uh, I thought of myself because you know, I thought if I was ever going to be a heavyweight boxer because I love I love Mike Tyson growing yeah, up. Yeah. And, and uh, you know he's a couple few years older than me, but we're close in age, and he was in my era. Yeah. And I was thought what kind of name would I have if I was a boxer? I go, let's see. And I was going, okay. My name would probably be, you know, oh, you know what? Mike the Lion Ryan, right? You oh, know? there you go. And, yeah. then, and then I changed it later on to Mike the Lionheart Ryan. So now that's the nickname I go by with everything is the Lionheart. You know, I, everything is the Lionheart. I, you know, I, I, that's who I am. It's Mike the Lionheart Ryan. I, I adopted the name from my fam, from family crest. Is the heart of the, my family crest is the heart of the lion. Yeah, that's right. It so, is. Uh, so I adopted that name as as my nickname, the lion heart. And uh, if I if I want to sign anything, you know, or whatever, I put I'll put in quotes the lion heart or something like that because that's who I am. I was given this ability 
because of of my family. You know, um, on the Ryan side, I'm not taking anything away from the Ryan side, but they weren't really an influence on me growing up. Well, yeah, well, you, didn't, you didn't know honest. them. You, you said you didn't, didn't get to know them until you were a teenager. Didn't know that part. I mean, I knew I was part Native American, knew I was Cherokee on my dad's side, I knew I was Irish, but that's all I ever knew. I didn't know my cousins, didn't know my, my, my uncles and aunts growing up. And even though they were instrumental after my dad passed away, um, they weren't instrumental when I needed them the most when I was a kid growing up. Right. And that's not their fault. That, right. you know, a lot of that blame was on my dad, but you know, my dad was battling demons that he couldn't fight. And, and he was in a tough situation. And I don't blame him. As, as I grew older, started realizing what, what happens with people in war and stuff like that. Start realizing you can't blame them for their, for their. Oh, of course not. No. That, you know, I have no. I, my, my cousin, my first cousin, my aunt's son was hurt in Afghanistan. It was Afghanistan. I think it was, I, I hope I don't misquote, but he was, he was blown up by an IED. Uh, he was, this is about. 10 years ago now, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the, the kid goes through, the, or goes to the army and goes through his boot camp and they say, well, you're not going to go to, you know, the Middle East right away. We're going to send you to Germany. Oh, they sent him to the Middle East. And lo and behold, he's out with, he, he, he they're fighting some insurgents and, you know, and, and they're shooting at each other and stuff. And the ID goes off. He's with his commanding officer. So my, my cousin's leg, I think it was the left leg, gets, gets blown up. On the left side, his commanding officer got the right side. So now my cousin walks with him. He still has his leg. He walks with a limp. Yeah. And he's dealing with, he's, he, I mean, he's been dealing with some stuff emotionally over oh, the, you know, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff. So I got to give a shout out to my cousin, George, you know what I mean? Because I, I know he's he's battling too. And and the thing is, is, you know, we all deal with our inner demons and we all deal with our inner battles. Yes. And for many years, I had to deal with a lot of stuff that I, a lot of anger issues that I had growing up because I saw, as a kid growing up, I saw this violence. And... You know, and I didn't touch on this part, but you know, I mean, you know, I I watched my stepdad pull a knife on my mom when I was when I was little, and that was wow. I was my 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 brother Ephraim was newly born, and they got in a big argument. My my stepdad drank, yeah, and he was very violent when he drank, yeah, and you know, I didn't want to go into all the gory details. I'm not, it wasn't any good gory about it, but you know, I had to grab his legs. I, I was five and a half years old. I grabbed his legs, yeah, and he looked oh he looked down at me. You know, because my mom was irritating him so bad, I guess it was. They were arguing. She had my brother, and he's yeah. he went and grabbed the knife and said, "Yeah." He was he was, he was just angry, and you know, I'm here. I'm grabbing my stepdad's legs, and he looks down at me. And I think he came to his senses because he loved me. You know, my I, to this day, my step my my ex stepdad and I, we have a good relationship. We, we when we see each other at birthday parties or whatever. I, I got to put that stuff in the past because I know that it was the alcohol that was taking him out of his right mind. It wasn't him as a person. He wasn't no angel, believe me. Right. As a person, either way, he was no mm -hmm. angel. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we see each other now as we hug and we talk and we just, you know, just we're friends and we just kind of, you know, that's all in the past. And, but that's in the book as well. You know, I had to write down some pretty, you know, hard stuff. Yeah. That happened. And, you know, it, it may rub some people the wrong way, but you know what? At the end of the day, look, it's part of what we went through. It's, I, it's I, real. I forgive you regardless. You know, yeah. I mean, it happened. Yeah. We've moved forward. And we've grown from it, you know? I mean, my dad, my stepdad's one of the best guys in the world if he's not drinking. He's nice. He's cool, you know? But he's, he's, he's a fighter, too. My brothers get that from him, you know? And, and, and uh, you know, it, it's, take, it's protecting my brothers along the way. You know, they got into some pretty rough stuff growing up, too. And, uh, but, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, as you get older and you start to become a man you grow, growing up, that you realize that you have a lot of this stuff inside and, you know, you, you have to find ways to try to deal with it. You could try to let it subside, but it's very difficult. You know, and my wife's been beating on me for years to go talk to somebody. And I don't know if it's a pride thing or, or anything. I, I'm at this age. I'm not prideful. I just need to do it. I know I know you need to speak to people and, and getting this message out like we're talking right now. This is a huge help writing this book was was very big for me because oh, yeah, I bet. a lot of people have purchased it already and they'll give me their insight. Yeah. Man, he goes, wow, you went through a lot. You know, you did all this. He goes, man, I can't believe that you you dealt with some of these things or, you know, and it's really interesting to see other people's side of, of the story. Yeah. So when you've seen violence in your life, when you've been hurt uh, mentally, emotionally, you know, physically, you know, you start to realize that, well, I'm nearly 48 years old. I'm married with kids. I have a good job. I have a lot of this great stuff around me that was work that I worked hard for. And I got through all of that. And I didn't have a lot of adult guidance. You know, my guidance was growing up. 
was my coaches. You know, mm-hmm. the coaches mm-hmm. are very in- instrumental huge, huge. In, in, in children's growth. No question. And I had a teacher tell me one time when we were, when Tommy wanted to play football, she lives in the neighborhood and you might know her. And uh, we were at a get together one time and she was, she told me, she goes, you know, you really should think about letting him play football because, you know, it could really mold him and really help him build mm-hmm. those relationships. Yeah. And I was like, ah, I don't think so. <laughs> I go, I go, <clears throat> you don't know what I went through and you don't know what it, it took to get to this point. And I don't think I can handle, I've already been through a lot with that kid when he was little. Yeah. And I go, I can't deal with him being injured. I don't think I, I don't think my wife and I can, can take it. And I, she made a good point. And I, from, from a teacher and a mom standpoint, I get it. And I, I appreciate the input. But when you have battled through life and death a bunch of times, several times, half a dozen times mm-hmm. in your life yeah. from all this stuff, you go, you don't want to put your children through that. Right. You know, you always want the best for your kids. You want to be better. You want them to be better yeah, than yeah, what you yeah, have. Yeah. And my mom wanted the same thing for us. Yes. And yeah, we've excelled quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And my brothers are doing great. You know, they, they're both working, making decent money. You know, they're, do, they're raising their own families. You nice. know, they're all doing great. Have their houses and stuff. And you know, I'm real proud. I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of my, my brothers in a lot of way. And I have nephews and I have a baby niece now, you know, nice. and I'm I, my, she, my, my daughter was the only girl in the family and, and kind of broke that chain. You okay. know, I, after 15 years, we finally got another little baby girl, my right youngest on. brother. And, uh, so, and she's cute. You know, so, so I, I got to enjoy a lot of these things that were almost taken away. Yeah. So when I look back on, on playing football and being injured, it's a very selfish way to look at that because, you know, I have these great relationships. You know, I, I get to meet you and Kim and yeah. your kids, girl, and we've always had this great relationship. You know, we've been around each other and, you know, coming up to North County, you know, after born and raised down there in South San Diego and, and just enjoying all the things that life has to give you. But, you know, it takes hard work. It takes a lot of uh, perseverance and perseverance can take you a long, long way. Perseverance got me out of that hospital fast. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Got me out of that hospital fast because I had yeah. a goal. Yeah. You know, John, when I was in the hospital. I told myself, next week, I'm going to be standing. Next week, I'm going to be walking. You know, next week, I'm getting all these tubes off of me. Next week, I'm going to be out of here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and it was goals you set every day. Yes. yes. And they work. They, yes, they work. They do man. work. People don't realize it. They, they don't believe in themselves. They don't have enough confidence that yes. they can take themselves to the next level. That's exactly right. And, and I wish I could apply that to my work, <laughs> to my work ethic, to my work life. Although I've been a hard worker for many years, you know, I'm getting older now. My body's taking a beating over the years, and you know, work tends at time to be somewhat toxic. And, yeah, it can and, be work, sure. it can, and so when you leave there, your body you has to detoxify and cleanse. And cleanse. <laughs> yeah. But I, I work around some really amazing people. I have some great people this run. Uh, I've been in the grocery industry for so many years. I've met so many great people. I have a great team of people I work that work for me. You know, look, I'm, I'm a produce manager. I manage a team of 12 people. Uh, um, obviously, I'm smart enough to manage some people. They, they, they trusted somebody like me to manage a team right and to, yeah, and to yeah, keep a, yeah. and to keep a section going every day. I hear people probably chuckling right now going, oh, my God, you know, this guy, he's barely getting by. You know? And uh, I'm like, well, you know what? Look, I, um, I've given 100 percent to a lot of things and I've given 100 percent to my work. Um, and I'm giving a hundred percent to me and my body and trying to build myself up. And I got to tell you, the only regret that I have is not giving 100% to my family. Biggest regret. My second biggest regret is probably not finishing school, you know, going to college and trying to better myself and being one, one of the only one, being the only kid to ever graduate college. And I use, can use every excuse in the book that football was supposed to be my ticket, but you know, bottom line is school was hard. It was very challenging for me. Yeah. And I wasn't strong enough to accept that challenge. And I truly regret that. Um, I am strong enough to accept the challenge that I need to work on some things in my own personal life and mm-hmm. with my family. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, my kids are almost grown. You mm-hmm. know, my son is grown and, and my daughter's on her way. And, uh, you know, and a lot of things that, you know, there's a lot of things that I did 
to that family that, you know, are irreparable, you know, unfortunately. I mean, things can be forgiven, but, you know, you go back and you're like, but geez, I shouldn't have said that. Or I should have did it this way. I should have said it that way. Or, you know, we all go through regrets. As men, oh, yeah, we, we, yeah. we we figure as, as, as committed men in yeah, relationships yeah. and to our families, yes. we always have those regrets. Well, I wish I would have been a better father. Yeah. I wish I would have been a better husband. I would have treated my wife a little bit better. We have you those know, moments, no doubt. Because I got to tell you, after all the stuff that I've been through and all the stuff that um, I've seen and all the things that I've done in my life, nothing compares to, you know, walking that aisle, you know, with, with my wife, my bride, you know, and, and that was probably, and I talk about it in the book, you know, when, when, when Glee and I finally got married, um, you know, we had dated, we got together at 20. Oh, so you mind if I touch on that story, how we met? Yeah, 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 yeah. I love <laughs> All it. right. So I know a lot, a lot of people get a kick out of the story. So my buddy, Dave, um, it was his 20th birthday. Now I had already turned 20. My birthday's in May. So Dave was your buddy that was there with you when yep. you were in the hospital. Yeah. I've known David since we were seven years old. Right on. So for yeah. 41 years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, for, no, 40 years this year. Okay. Matter of fact, I got to call him tonight and say, hey, happy anniversary. Yeah. 40 years. Cause we met when we were seven years old. Uh, we were in second grade. It was in January. And we were going to be eight because we turned eight in second grade. Yeah. And so... So I had already turned twenty. My buddy Kurt, who I who is also in the book too, he's one of my, he's one of my close friends, and uh, you know we've we've had some we've had some turmoil here in the last couple of years, and uh, but we're gonna work on that, you know. Um, and he's been through a battle himself. He got injured in a car accident really badly. I know he's dealing with some things, and I just want him to know that you know I love him. Yeah, right on. And um, so so Kurt had turned. 20 in April, I turned 20 in May, and Dave turned 20 in June. Okay. So our birthdays are right after one another. Mm -hmm. So there's this girl that we worked, that I worked with. Her name was Rose. And, um, you know, she had taken Galit to this birthday party. We all worked together at the store. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I'm sitting next to Dave and his then girlfriend. And um, so Rose comes walking in with Galit. And they sit down at the far side of the table. And this is when actually Galit and Stephanie rekindled their friendship. Oh, nice. Okay. Because they hadn't seen each other in years. Yeah. But But the funny thing is, was they lived right around the corner from each other for many years. And I keep asking Galit, well, you knew that you lived right around the corner. How come you didn't hang out with her? Mm -hmm. I, I think there was a stretch there where they moved to that neighborhood. But for maybe she forgot that Stephanie lived right around the corner. Yeah. And, and people's lives are kind of going in different yeah, paths. And yeah, it was sure. one of those things. So they yeah. so they met. And, and you know, yeah. Stephanie and I were close and friends and everything. And her mom was there. Everybody was there because all of us were real close. David and everybody. Yeah. And uh, so David's uh, girlfriend at the time says to me, hey, Mike, Rose brought a friend. Why don't you go down there and introduce yourself? Because it had been like two years since I had a girlfriend. After high yeah, school, yeah, yeah. we'll see. But after, after after high school, after I recovered from my injury, yeah. my surgery, yeah, I was in the gym five six days a week, and I was working graveyards. I went okay. on a night crew. Yeah. Didn't look back for many years. I was in the gym like an animal. I was just in there, just working out every day and working. That's all I did. Yeah. And um, so I got to know Rose from the store and everything like that. You know, and I guess she wanted to kind of hook me up. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, so she brings, you know, she brings Khalid along and, and, uh, they go, Mike, go down there and introduce yourself, man. Go down there. And yourself. So I'm like, all right. And at this time I hear I'm 20 years old. Right. Yeah. And I got this chest, you know, the small waist Oh yeah. and I had this yeah. mullet thing going on back here, <laughs> nice. you know, but I had these, <laughs> I had these shoulders. I still got the shoulders, you know, but, but they're a little thicker now because of the extra yeah. weight, you know, yeah. but, but I was lean, man. I was looking good. I was, I, I, I stood up and I was like, uh, a lion. I was, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's, yeah, you know yeah, all this. Yeah, you know, yeah. I was walking that pride. And I was, I, I, so I walked down the table, you know, I walked down to the end of the table mm -hmm. and I walk up to Rose and says, Hey Rose, how you doing? You know? And, and she's all, Hey Mike, you know, this is a, this is my friend Galit. And I go, excuse me. You know, I want to make sure I didn't mess her name because yeah. it's a name I've never heard before. Yeah, right. You know, and she go, and, and, and Galit says, it's Galit. Yeah. She, pro yeah. she real pronunciated, yeah. you know, and I was like, yeah. okay. Yeah. And we shook hands and you know, she, she shook my shook my hand, yeah. like real, like shook it. Yeah. Not like oh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Just she shook my hand, like right hey, on. I'm here. Right on. And I was like, wow, I like this. Yeah. Uh, I like her, you know. And yeah. And and it was funny because after the party ended, we said our goodbyes and everything like that. And I took Stephanie home, you know, and uh, she we rode together. Like I said, we we're we we're best friends, yeah. you know. Yeah. Took her home, and uh, so I was trying to 
you know, she asked me before, so what happened was, let me go back a little, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. So Glee gets up to use the bathroom. And Rose looks at me, she goes, Mike, she thinks you're cute. You want her phone number? <laughs> and I go, are you serious? I'm like, wow, I'm like, this came out of left field. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And I was like, you know what? Not right now. Let's, I'll get from you later at work, you know? Yeah. And uh, I didn't see her for a week. I was working crew, so yeah. I never saw her. <clears throat> well, Rose's boyfriend at the time, we were pretty good friends at the store, he calls me up and says, Hey, Mike, he goes, I got Khalid's phone number for you, you know? Yeah, and everyone uh, who doesn't work in this. <laughs> yeah, he's all, he gave me the number. I called her up, like, the next day. I called her up, and I talked to her mom on the phone or whatever it was, and finally she called me back. You know, we talked, planned about her coming over. She came over. I was living with my grandmother at the time. Uh -huh. I moved in with my grandmother and uh, after, high after high school. Because uh, after the surgery, I just, after the last surgery I had, I was with my mom. My brothers were younger, and just, I wasn't getting enough rest. And then I was going, and then I recovered. And then um, um, I uh, couldn't sleep because there was a lot of noise going on around the house. Yeah, and yeah. I needed to sleep during the day. Yeah. <laughs> so my grandmother hooked it up. She let me stay there. And I was there. I ended up being there for five and a half years, you know, until I got married. So saved a ton of money. My grandmother really, she really helped me out a lot. Right on. And we were really close, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Glee started coming over. And then we started kind of, you know, started kind of hanging out. And, our, and we just talking on the phone hanging out and then we made a first date and uh and uh we were like okay you know i'm gonna play softball after work so i worked all night long and me and the guys and some of the girls yeah. from the store went and played a game softball i can't remember, i think it was morley field okay and down you know east san diego down yeah. there you know yeah. city heights and played down at morley field we played all day and galit was there and she sat there the whole day with all the rest of some of the wives and girlfriends yeah. hung out watched me play and I was like, man, I, I really like this girl. And she stood there all day and watched well, she me play. clearly and, liked you. And I, yeah. And, and I was I was exhausted. I was tired. Yeah. Worked all night long, played all day. And we made a plan to go to the movies. So she comes over. Uh, I got cleaned up. She got cleaned up, whatever. She came over. And we were going to go get something to eat. And I'm like, well, you know, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll take you out to eat. Where, where you want to go? And and we, la we laugh about this. We tell people this story all the time. She said... Uh, she goes, well, I could really go for some rolled tacos. All right. I'm like, oh, yeah, cheap date. You know, like, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't have to, yeah, I, I'm really wanting to dine her on this one. So on Montezuma Road, because my, my grandma lived over by San Diego State. Yeah. My mom lives in that house now. Her house actually overlooks uh, Alvarado Hospital off, oh, the, eight, off okay. the 8 freeway. Okay. And uh, so we drove down Montezuma to this taco shop on the corner of College and Montezuma Road. And some of my friends here that are trying oh, I know to, exactly which one you're talking about. It's that taco shop right it there It looks the like an old Dorito snitch. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we drove through, got her the rolled tacos, went back to my grandmother's house, yeah. and we, we we ate. And and then we went to go see, uh, we went to the movies after that. We went to go see Backdraft when it first came out, you know? Oh, yeah. That and was that, Kurt Russell, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And it, we went to, then it was called the Trolley 8 Theater. That It's gone, I think long gone. Mm -hmm. So... We get there, we're getting comfortable, we get our seats, and we're picking back, you know, just relaxing. And mind you, I hadn't slept all night or all day. I've, oh, no. I, I was, oh, no. <laughs> so the lights went out, I and so did I. I. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm just, you know, just sitting there snoring and, 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 and falling asleep. She's nudging me, and I'm waking up, and I'm trying to chime in through the movie. Yeah, and yeah. She's all, you know, wake up, wake up. And every time I tell the story, she looks over and she goes, yeah, look, do you believe I still married him? <laughs> and, and to this day, unfortunately, and I have to apologize to my wife, you know, I've been to many events where I've fallen asleep at these events. Well, you, you have a good excuse for this one, though. I mean, you've been. I was working, well, because graveyards, yeah. graveyards, you know, okay, so I worked graveyards about nine years on the, the, at the yeah. grocery store. Yeah. And I think it did some irreputable damage to my body, you know, um, not only being a brain injury survivor, head injury survivor, yeah. and all that stuff, and working graveyards for so many years, it's not natural. I, it's not. I, I think I have a permanent, uh, a permanent situation where it's uh, a sleep syndrome, and uh, a sleep. Uh, I think it's called. Uh, I think it was called sleep syndrome or something like that. I'm drawing a blank on it right now, but um, shift shift syndrome. They okay. call it okay. shift okay. syndrome. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I do have apnea, by the way, too, yeah. and I probably had that for many years. But you know, uh, but but as a kid. I, I, after my injury, I, I was more tired often. So I, mean, I remember talking to my aunt about it. My aunt worked at the hospital. She worked at UCSD Medical Center for many years. And she we had these conversations where she said, you know, I've talked to some doctors and they said that, you know, brain injury survivors tend to just be more tired than your average person. 
So not only was I struggling with being tired, but I was also working night crew. I was working graveyard. And I did that for about nine years. So I put some damage on my body. So, you know, um, so we dated for from 20 and we were 20 years old when we started dating and at 22 i asked her to marry me you know so this is a really cute story i hope and yeah i said cute so you know whatever <laughs> yeah um so we met the spaghetti factory when we were 20. so i figured because we used to like to go down there our friends and i and we had a big pack of friends that we used to yeah. hang out with so i assembled the i assembled the troops and I told him, um, and she, I told him, I said, well, I'm going to propose to Galit, and I want to do it at the spaghetti factory. Down in uh, the gas lamp. Yep. Yeah, yeah right downtown. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, it was funny because this this uh, gemologist or jeweler lady uh, who knew Galit, and I met her through Galit, and we got to become friends and stuff, and she's the one who did the rings for her. Oh, perfect. And I got with her, and her name was Jackie, and, and uh, I said, hey, I want to... Uh, she showed me these two rings. Um, uh, they're wedding bands with, with diamonds in them, and they were flat on top. Mm-hmm. I said, can you custom make the engagement ring to look like that? She said, yeah, no problem. She made it round and then flat and then the stone on top. Oh, nice. And uh, so I think Galit knew I was going to ask her because I think Jack kind of spilled the beans just a little bit. You yeah. know, hey, I got your rings kind of thing. And uh-huh. she's like, oh, well. Yeah. But she didn't know when. Yeah. <clears throat> so she just thought we were all going out to dinner. Yeah. And I had... My buddy videotaping, I think it was Dave or somebody was videotaping, had one of the old big cameras yeah, with the VHS, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. so I, you know, I basically gave a speech. I said, hey, you know, we're all here having a good time and everything, and this is the night where I asked Galit to marry me. And she's like, no way. And I got down on my knee like a soldier. <laughs> nice. And right there on the corner of Fifth Avenue or wherever it was at, you know, and and I'm yelling over this speaker. They're, they're calling out names to oh, come yeah. in. Really. <laughs> and yeah. it's, I still have the video, you know? And uh, so we, we got engaged, but... One uh, one cool little story before that was well not cool I was, I was pissed off going into this um, engagement which so I had rings the rings in the box I was house sitting at this house and Dave and his girl then girlfriend came over and uh, one of the boxes was kind of loose luckily it was the two wedding bands and not the engagement ring because I had it in my pocket he goes let me check out the rings man and so I gave him a box and he went and grabbed the box the top it's opened. And one of the wedding bands, they both fell out, I think, or one of the wedding bands fell out. Boink, boink, boink. Oh, no. Into the heater vent on the oh, bottom floor. Oh, oh, no. I was like, dude, you're so lucky that wasn't the engagement ring. I mean, I was angry. I was yeah, really, yeah. it wasn't, and I felt horrible because it wasn't his fault. I was mad at the situation. Yeah, right. It was right. an accident. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it could happen yeah, to anybody, yeah, you know? Right, right. And he was bummed out. Oh, man. no doubt. He was bummed out. Yeah. And, uh, but I had the wedding ring. And that was the one that I popped out. Okay. I explained to Galit later on what happened. And so, you know, we fixed everything. You know, we got to recover the other yeah, yeah, so here's what <laughs> happened. So I gave her the ring. She's wearing it. She's all proud, you know. And uh, um, I'll talk about this ring in a little bit, by the way. I had this ring custom made. Nice. Uh, this is celebrate my 30th year of survival. Oh, well, cool. Um, so since I'm never going to get a Super Bowl ring or a championship ring, this, yeah. I had one made. 30 years of survival, I think I earned it. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the ring. <laughs> um, so the one of my buddies is videotaping us, and, you know, Gleet and I are snuggled up. You know, she's all happy. We're ordering our food and everything, and one of my buddies still videotaping, you know. And when he gets to Dave, Dave's sitting there going, he's sitting there like this the whole time. And I told I said, listen, I was telling Gleet, I said, listen, I was going to bring both boxes. I was going to show you the wedding band. So I'll show you what everything's going to look like. You know, we put it all together. And unfortunately, the box opened. You know, I gave the box to Dave so he can look at it. When he grabbed it, the box opened and one of them went into the vent. And she saw, what? I said, he feels really bad about it. So, you know, we'll try to get it out later. Let's just have fun right now. And so... All of us met at a former friend of mine's house. Um, they call him former because we had a falling out years ago and, um, you know, things happen. Yeah, things happen. And, mm-hmm. and uh, we all met there. We used to meet at that place all the time. And so Glee and I went to the house I was house sitting at and um, we found it. We see it. I could see it down there and uh, we got a curtain rod or something and we stick it was. I'm gonna embarrass her by saying this, but it was funny. So I have to, I, you know, I want to tell the story the way the way it happened. So I can't get in there, you know. So she pulls off her shirt, <laughs> pulls off her shirt, so she can have more wiggle room, you know. Right, right. And she's getting in there, and she's 
I go, I see it right there. She's all, no way. I go, there, there it is. She's getting down there and she's edging it up, edging it up. Yeah, she's got, she got, yeah. it, got it hooked under there and she's pulling it up to the corner and we're able to pull the ring out. And oh. I was like, oh. And then, uh, so we go, okay, so let's break the news today, make sure, get him off the hook. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went back to this guy's house and, and uh, we told him, hey, man. We got the ring. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like, his, yeah, his, well, yeah. his, his whole demeanor changed. Oh, yeah, you know? yeah. Whole demeanor changed. So, yeah. you know, so for that year and a half or so that we were engaged, you know, Galit's really putting work in to get our wedding set up, you know, and she worked really, really hard. I'm so proud of her. Um, we got married at Carlton Oaks Country Club in Santee. Nice. And we got married in July of 95 mm -hmm. and uh, July 22nd. So our anniversary is right around the corner. And uh, couldn't have been a more beautiful day, beautiful wedding. Things worked out perfect you know we had such a great time um i gotta credit her for all the work she really put all the legwork in into it and what bride soon to be bride doesn't put a lot of the legwork oh, into yeah. Oh, yeah. getting the wedding oh, set yeah. up you know oh, what yeah. i mean oh yeah <clears throat> so she really put a lot of effort into it um we had these great photographers and um they just amazing they really helped it was a husband it was a, well their boyfriend and girlfriend at the time they're they've been since married many many years um really helped us a lot he was organizing the guys. She was helping with the girls and that kind of stuff. Even though we had an event planner, a wedding planner, that kind of stuff. Um, he basically told us in our interview with him that he goes, we are your organizers. He goes, we are going to set you up wherever you need to be. We are going to be there setting you up. You know, you may have somebody, you know, getting the wedding going, everything like that. But we're the ones who are going to set you up where you need to be when we take these photos. Amazing. Took some great pictures, had a blast. It was an awesome wedding. We had a lot of fun. Um, Dave was my best man. Uh, Kurt was my second best man. And then my brother, Efren and Frank were on that side. Stephanie was Khalid's maid of honor. And then she had her other friends, Giselle and Stephanie's sister, Michelle was in it. And uh, and then uh, Kim, another friend of uh, Galit's that was there. And it was it was great, man. I couldn't couldn't be a better wedding. You know, it was just, it was just a lot of fun, perfect weather on the golf course there. You know, um, it was, it was amazing. It was, it was, my, so awesome. it was, it was my dream come true after it made everything that I battled for up until that moment, um, uh, made everything that I battled for just 100% worth it. And that was just the beginning. I mean, look, I mean, nearly 24 years later, you know, it's, it's still work, but now it's, it's, uh, we're starting to enjoy the fruits of our labor. And, um, you know, I, I look at my past as, you know, definitely the launching board to where I am today. And I wouldn't have this life if I went a different direction. Right. That's right. You know, if, what if I didn't get hurt? You know, who knows? I mean, I probably wouldn't be married to my wife. You know, I wouldn't have the kids that I have, you know, or something, another one turn just off that path. Yes. The relationships that didn't work out. Yes. The, the injury, the, uh, you know, the, you know, this, that, and the other, just never know that the job decision that I made to stay in the business. Yeah. The friend you know, that introduced you. you exactly. Know, exactly. You know, yeah. Had, had, had I not been in the business, mm -hmm. I would never have met my wife, you know, and. Um, obviously my wife, you know, came here from another country when she was little, Yeah. had her parents not made that decision. You know, yeah. this is one, one yeah. decision yeah. could change the world What my great grandparents never, you know, yeah. decided to come to America from right. Sicily, you know? And, and, uh, so you look at all the stuff that got us here today. We all came from somewhere. I'm proud to say that I came from very modest, very meager upbringing and, 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 and in a area that, you know, very, you know, I wouldn't say very few succeed from, but you know, it's things could happen really easily. They can go really wrong or they can go really right, depending on timing and where you're at in those neighborhoods, you know, and, and what you're dealing with. Yes, that's right. And and I had a lot of good guidance, and I I got to be thankful. Well, that's I'm, incredible. The good guidance, given the tumultuous you know situation in your family. Yeah. Your father, you know, really not in the picture at all until you, you really didn't get to know him till later. Your, right, yeah. your stepfather only there for a part of the time. Yeah. Um, you know, your mother, you said she had some health issues. So <clears throat> yeah. I mean, health issues later on, you yeah. know, but she, you know, you know, my mom was her own, my mom is and, and was her own worst enemy for many years, you know, mm -hmm. and she pushed a lot of people away with the, the way she treated people. And obviously her, her, her religious decisions, you know, yeah. um, affected a lot of relationships. Of course, she's missed out on all the, you know, birthdays, Christmases, mm -hmm. things like that, because they don't celebrate that stuff. Right. Um, you know, my mom wants, would like me and my brothers to come over more and visit with the kids and whatnot. But, you know, 
my kids are grown now. And it's like, you know, she missed out on all the important times in her life when she should have been there. And, and that's something she's going to have to live with, you know, unfortunately. And, you know, I mean, she's my mom. I love her, but you know, it's one of those things where, you know, you make decisions. This was clearly a decision, you know, they didn't make you become what you are. You chose that path for yourself. And it's like we talked about before, you know, you, you could have walked down any path you want and, and the right path, you know, is the one that's right in front of you most of the time. Keep on the straight and narrow, stay right. on the path. Right. And if you divert from that path, who knows, you take, you're kind of taking a chance. Yeah. We all take chances in life and sometimes we take paths to other areas. And a lot of times, luckily we, we realize it's the wrong path and we're able to find our way back. Right. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, there's yeah. a lot of people that aren't able to find their way back. No. You know, yeah. you know, my mother made a decision to be a witness and it's actually become a witness helped her in a lot of ways. She was going through a uh, very, you know, turmoil, you know, turmoil part of her life where she was just kind of, you know, doing a lot of drinking and, you know, going to bars and hanging out and stuff like that. And, you know, just smoking and she stopped all of that. Good. So mm-hmm. I have to be thankful for that. Yeah. You know, I'm thankful for the witnesses for helping her and, and getting her on her straight and narrow. Um, she's very devoted, you know, she's very devoted to that. And, and I, I, I got it. I got to, Show some appreciation towards that. But unfortunately, the most important thing in your life that you're not showing real devotion to is your family. I think family, I think, you know, a lot of people say, well, God comes first, then your family. But, you know, I can't believe that because I'm, I'm not a believer. I'm not a I'm not a religious person. So yeah. I'm thinking your family is, is what makes you. Yeah. Yeah. The neighbor, it's like I said about the neighborhoods. You know, you don't you don't choose your neighborhood. Your neighbor chooses you. Yeah. You don't choose your family. You know, you, you you're given a family. You be lucky to have a family. That's right. And you should treasure that. You know, that's why I never forget where I came from. That's why I have, I still communicate with all the friends. I went to high school with a lot of them through social media and we talk and believe me, there's been some turmoil between me and these people from different remarks being made, whatever, but you learn from it. Yeah, you do. You learn from whether it's political, whether it's racial, whether it's uh, gender, whether it's, it doesn't matter what it is. It, if, if you put out something out there and you put yourself out there, people are going to call you out on it. And if I got some good friends that have called me out plenty on some things and, you know, and I, and Hey, rightly so. Maybe I put something in context that shouldn't have been put there and I had to fix that. And so I'm very privileged. My life is very well, you know, very fulfilled with wonderful people. And I'm very thankful for that. So, you know, and I would, I would have, I wish my mother would have been able to enjoy a lot of that. And, you know, my brothers right now, me and my brothers were having some, you know, you know, tough times, dealing with her because uh, of a lot of the, a lot of the pain, a lot of the hurt, a lot of the uh, things that she's kind of done to herself and to us and everything. And, you know, it's, it's tough because you, you, you have parents and you're not going to be here forever and you want to make good on most of that stuff. And like I was telling you earlier, when she got sick, you know, we had to make peace with some stuff and, and uh, it's still difficult because I'm battling demons every day, you know, and that's what I call them. Just call it what it is, you yeah, know? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah. We all, we all have demons that we got to fight. And, um, you know, whether it's due to my injury, whether it's due to my upbringing, whatever it is, you know, life is never easy. And um, if anybody tells you, oh, it's a piece of cake, no. <laughs> you, you don't, yeah. it, unless your family is crazy rich and, and you you know, and, and, and they're just, you know, even still, there's been a lot of kids who grew up with rich families that are just complete messes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Every, you know? <clears throat> life is a struggle. It doesn't matter what kind of resources yeah, you have. Yeah, absolutely. That means different people have different challenges. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I agree. 100%. I go, you know, some of the best people on this planet came from nothing. Right. And became something because they, right. they worked hard at it. That's right. And, and are very humbled. Um, you know, and at times I need to kind of humble myself a little bit more and, and realize that, you know, these were gifts. My wife and my kids, bar none, most important thing to me in the history of my life. They are my gifts. Everything else that I have, the friendships, the relationships, the house, the cars, you know, the money, you know, that I have is they're all, you know, icing on the cake. You know, the the family was uh, the absolute pinnacle of everything. It's because what I wanted I mean, since I was a kid, I said, I want to get married. I want to have a good job. I want to get married. I want to have kids. Mm-hmm. I worked hard at all of that. And I wanted to make that happen. I met the right person at the right time. <clears throat> got married, had, you know, I had the kids, got the house, cars. And, um, you know, I'm a big car nut. I love cars. Mm-hmm. Got a lot of cars at home. Um, and that's one thing I was really, I really loved about my son. And I, you know, over the years, Tommy and I had 
a strained relationship. You know, we bickered and fought over the years. And, and But that's one thing that we had in common that we really enjoyed together to this day. Cars. Nice. He's texting me from school. He says, Dad, you check out this car. <laughs> He's like, Craigslist or something. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. uh, I don't think so, buddy. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, you know, it's some muscle car or something like that. I go, yeah. Why don't you graduate first and we'll talk about stuff like that. Right. Get a job, baby, you know? Yeah, and, yeah. you know, it's one of those things that we're living... My son and I have this really neat relationship now, and I just love b- him being a man. Mm, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. love seeing Tommy as a man, yeah. just like you see Trevor, I'm yeah, sure, yeah, you know, and yeah. it's it, it's really it's really special stuff. Um, I look back on my life, and, you know, and, and when we talked about football, we talked about Tommy playing, and he did try out a couple of times. I went ahead and did it, and, you know, he finally figured out on his own that it wasn't for him. I couldn't have been more happy, you yeah. know, but, you know, I wanted him to have that experience and he did, he tried it and didn't like it. So yeah. he was done. And, yeah. and, and for years, you know, I would talk to my kids about my scars and about my injury and stuff like that. And I would talk to them about that stuff, you know, and hopefully they picked up on some of the things, some of my mistakes and some of the ways that I, I handled situations mm-hmm. that they know that to handle. I mean, my daughter, Sarah, she's, <laughs> she's amazing. She's an amazing kid. She, she's really smart. She, she gets good grades and I don't, I don't give her enough credit by how intelligent she is at almost 16. She's a very smart young lady. Right on. And I'm like, well, I'll have conversations with her. And she's just, <clears throat> she's just, I always knew she was going to be a really great kid, really intelligent kid. I remember holding her when she was like five years old. We we're watching something on TV and you know, there's this book out there, you know, the five love languages or whatever, yeah, you know, and that's yeah. a really great book, actually. You know, I had to use some of that stuff. I've, I've read some of it. It's great. And they talked about the love tank or something in your body, but keeping it full. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting there and Sarah's five years old. She's in kindergarten. <clears throat> and we're talking about something on the TV. I'm holding her on my lap. And we're just kind of hanging out. And she says, her comment was, yeah, daddy, it keeps their buckets full. And I guess it was talking about like happiness or something like that. Yeah. I go, I'm like, I go, what are you talking about, Sarah? She goes, well, we learned that in class that, you know, if you, if you do nice things, we were talking about doing nice things or being a nice person or whatever, you're being nice to somebody. She goes, if you do nice things to people, it keeps their buckets full. Yeah, that's right. They're love buckets. I go, yeah. I, go, I, go I go, buckets. She goes, they're love buckets, daddy. I go, love. It was just, the same. it was like she, at five years old. She already had it figured out that you had to be nice to people. You should be nice to people because it fills them. It fills them up inside. It, right. it gets them going. That's a, that's a heavy concept for a five-year-old to understand. John. Yeah. When Sarah was two years old, she was crying about something. And, 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 uh, <laughs> and Khalid's all, Mike, come here. And I go, what's going on? She goes, ask Sarah, what's the matter? Two years old. I go, Sarah, what's the matter? And she looks at me and she goes, Daddy, my sweater doesn't match my shoes. <laughs> I'm like, She's two? I'm like, you're two years old. You're two. She had me wrapped the day she was born. Wow. She's about one. She's standing over by the water bottle. We're at the table eating. I'm with Tommy right here. And I'm just, I'm going, I'm chowing down, you know, and, you know, the water tanks, you yeah, know, press yeah. the button and yeah. the water. So I guess Khalid was slapping her hand away from it and, you know, pushing her hand away. And she's all, Mike, Mike, look over. I look over and Sarah's looking at back at me like this. Her eyes are welling with tears and she had the lip. Oh. It was over. Oh, it yeah. was over. Yeah, I was yeah. done. I go, I'm looking at her and, and she goes, she keeps trying to open the water, you know, trying to get the water come out. I keep pushing her hand away. But she's looking at me. And, and I'm going, she killed me from that moment. I was done. I was over. I was like, I, I tell the story. I've told it a hundred times, a million times, you know, and, and uh, you know, it was like, and I feel so bad for saying this, but I get up from the chair. I go, oh, I can't take it, Glee. I can't take it. I get up. I walk over. I pick Sarah up and I go, don't worry, baby. I go. She's just mean. And I Ooh. walked away. Oh. And I walked away with her, right? No. Oh, my God. It was, oh. that was not good. <laughs> that was, that was not good. You know, and she's like, what? She's yeah. like, I'm like, and I'm holding her. And she goes, man, she goes, she's got you. I go, yeah. yeah you know, 
there's something to be said about a father and daughter relationship. Yeah, yeah. And a, and a father and son relationship. They're completely different. They're very different. You handle them differently. Yes, you do. And even Sarah knows. Well, you, even Tommy and, and Glee would say, you know, you treat Sarah differently than you treat Tommy. I'm like, well, Tommy's going to be a man someday. And I don't want him, I don't want this world to punk him and be, be you know, treat him like he's nothing. I want him to be, I want him to grow up and be smart and I want him to be strong yeah. and I want him to be able to take care of himself. And, and I don't want to be mean to him on purpose, but I also want him to know that this world is tough. And, you know, my whole life I was raised by women and we, you know, Grant, these women were, <laughs> were rough women. My grandmother included, you know, she was one to speak her mind and, uh, but I wanted my daughter to know she was she was in a loving capacity and that she also needed to protect herself too. But as a man, it was I always felt like it was my job to protect our women. I'm very protective. I work around a lot of women. I'm mm -hmm. very protective of them. Yeah. I'm very yeah. protective of my wife, right. you know, and my daughter. Um, and my daughter knows that. You know, I'm very protective, especially now that she's got a boyfriend. So... <laughs> Oh man. Oh. So can I touch on that for a second? I mean, we got time, right? We, we got unlimited time. <laughs> All right. I'm sure a lot of people are going to chime in maybe and say something about this later. Man, dude, you kind of went on for a while. I'm like, well, you know what? It's time to get this out. So, so as a dad, you know, you have one of each, just like I do. Right. Um, that first boyfriend's never easy. <laughs> so, you know, and she's 15, you know, yeah. about to be 16. And, so Glee comes home, and I don't know this. I'm like the last to find out about this, right? Probably she by design. <laughs> probably by design. <clears throat> Rightly so, because yeah. I don't tend to handle these situations yeah. very well. So Sarah has a, like seven girlfriends she hangs around, seven or eight or so. They, they're like the Fab 20 or whatever they are. Yeah. They have this group. They hang around each other. They've been friends since they were, you know, a couple of them have been friends since they were four years old. One of her friends I've known since she was four years old, you know, and, and uh, love these girls. You know, they're great. You know, they're a lot of fun. And, you know, they all, I knew it was coming because they were all hanging out with these boys and their boys in their groups yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. Good looking bunch of boys, you know, young boys, you know, and, and uh, it's it's really, I'm wondering, she goes, well, Lexi's got a boyfriend, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, when, when's she going to come home? Because Sarah asked me this a few years back when she was like 11 or 12 or something. She says, dad, how can I be when I'm, when I, when I can start dating? I go, uh, well, either you're, f well, when you're 40 or I'm dead. <laughs> And she goes, well, mom said I could be six. Mom said I I, I I could be sixteen and start dating. And I go, really? I go, well, we'll see about that. Right. And uh, <laughs> so lo and behold, she's fifteen, and I'm going on. Oh. But you know, then again, I met my first girlfriend, my first real girlfriend in high school at fifteen. You know, yeah, so yeah, yeah. I can't. It would be hypocritical for me to yeah. tell her she can't. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And uh, so a few months back, you know. Tommy, or yeah, back in December, I think it was, Tommy's home for a break. This is going to be the first time I'm meeting this boy. He's driving, so he's same grade, but he's a little older. He comes over to the house. I said, I need to meet this boy. I go, mom's met him. Mom's met his mom. I haven't met him yet. So if he's coming over to pick you up, I go, I want him to come to the door. Oh, no. And if he honks that horn, <laughs> I'm going to go out there and send him on his way. Uh -oh. If he doesn't be a man, if he's not going to be a man and come to the door and knock on the door and introduce himself... You're not going with him. And uh, so I had to put my foot down on that one, you know, because that's like, that's, you don't roll up to somebody's house and honk a horn and come on out. Yeah. You be a man, you walk up to, the, you introduce yourself to, yeah. so what if the father's 250 plus pounds and he probably pound you into oblivion, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but, you know, I hear the door knock and I'm sitting on the couch and, you know, like a knucklehead. So when he comes over, I'm put my hat on backwards. I'm gonna have my sunglasses on. I'm gonna walk through the door, and uh, well, she's like, "Don't put your sunglasses." He's like, "Don't put your sunglasses on." Yeah. But I end up wearing a hat because I always wear a hat, especially after I'm at work. I wear a hat, and then when I'm sitting around, I, I throw a hat on backwards. You know. Yeah. So he comes to the door. He knocks on the door, and Tommy comes down the stairs. This is the first time Tommy's meeting him. You know, Tommy's a strapping young lad. Yeah. He's about 180 something pounds. He's a good sized kid. He comes running down the stairs, and Glee answers the door with Sarah. I grab my hat, I put it on backwards. I'm wearing a white t-shirt and chest is out and I walk up and I, I walk up to this kid, you know, and if you don't know me, I tend to be a bit imposing and, and I don't always have a smile on my face. So when I don't have a smile on my face, it tends to look a little bit threatening at times, I guess. So I come walking up to this kid and I stick my hand out. I go, I go, Hey Miles, how you doing, man? And I walk up to him 
And I grab his hand, I shake his hand, and yeah. I, I gave him a little shake, you know, yeah, a little yeah, tight shake. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I got yelled at for that, by the way, later on. <laughs> Why? So, well, I'll get to that in a second. Okay. So I shake his hand, yeah. and I, I give him a nice little grip. Yeah. And first thing I'm thinking to myself, I'm going, damn, this is a good looking kid. Yeah, right on. Good looking kid. So Sarah's like, okay, okay, we're going to go now. And, yeah, and, yeah. and so they <laughs> right. left. And, you know, Tommy, I hear Tommy go down, and Tommy meets him, and Tommy's all, you know, Tommy's got the slang going. He goes, yeah. he goes, Yo, what's up, man? He goes, what's good? You know, and he shakes yeah, his yeah, hand yeah. everything. And uh, so they leave, and the three of us, Galit and Tommy and I, are sitting there, and uh, Tommy's like, man, he's a really good-looking I go, good looking kid. I go, yeah, that he's a damn good-looking kid. I'm going, man, their kids are probably going to be really nice, too. And Galit's like, <laughs> you stop that, you know? And this is, I'm like, yeah. she goes, later on, after a conversation, I don't know, weeks down the road or whatever, we were talking about that handshake. Yeah. She goes, I know you were shaking his hand really hard. I could tell you were. I could tell how you were shaking his hand. I know you. I could tell you were shaking it really hard. I go. I gave him a solid grip, and I wanted him to know by that grip that I was a strong man. I wasn't gonna let anybody anything happen to my daughter. She's my angel. It's my little girl. No man is gonna hurt her. That's what he needed yeah, to know. Yeah, that's a good and, message. Uh, I go, but I was very nice to him. Yeah. And he, I, he came over to the house before again another time, and nice kid. Yeah, I shook his hand, came and come on in, man, come on in, you know, and, and we talked for a minute, you know, my dogs were getting a little bit unruly, so I, I was kind of concentrating yeah. on the dogs, and one thing that got me, though, was Sarah said that he saw the cars in the garage one day, and, you know, I have a couple of old Z cars, you know, I'm in the Datsuns and yeah. stuff like that, and, you know, of course, Galit has a nice car, and we got a few cars out there, you know, have a lot, we have a lot of cars, it's ridiculous, and uh, he complimented on the cars. He goes, man, you guys got some really nice cars. He goes, I really like the old Z's, you know? And he goes, those are your dad's. And Sarah's like, yeah. He goes, I'm like, all right, all right. Yeah. He likes old cars. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm starting to like this yeah, kid, you know? Yeah. But haven't really had a chance to sit with him and have a conversation, just like two guys talking or anything like that. I think Sarah's still on the edge about how I'm going to react. And I'm like, you know what? I said, don't worry. If you guys want to come over and hang out, you can come over and hang out because they hang out at his house when his mom's there and they go out, they'll meet at places or whatever, and I'll drop her off. And it's all good, you know, And because Tommy went through the whole girlfriend thing in high school uh, with somebody, but he was older. So, you know, he yeah. started he started later with, with the girls than, than Sarah did and uh, with the boys. And and uh, so you get to you get that father instinct kicking in. But, you know, I'm I'm. At the end of the day, I'm, I'm proud of both of them because they Great actually kids. they're 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 experiencing that yeah. kind of stuff, and they should mm -hmm. they should experience relationships, they should experience love and 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 and, and go through the relationship thing and, and the whole high school environment because you never know what's gonna, where it's going to take. I mean, look, it, it took me to a whole nother level. You know, it's funny that, that <clears throat> Galit was giving you a hard time for shaking his hand too much strongly. Yeah, but that's what she did to you when you met her. <laughs> she she gave me. She gave me the sense of confidence when she shook my hand. The, when I shook the kid's hand, it gave him a sense of intimidation. <laughs> so so here, here, here's what happened yeah. was when they walked out, he turned to Sarah and goes, your dad's a pretty big dude. He's pretty jacked. And, <laughs> and she goes, yeah, I know. And, and uh, she told me later on, she goes, we were talking about it and everything. We were talking about the shake and we're talking about meeting him and stuff like that. She goes... Well, are you happy you intimidated him? He's intimidated by you. Are you happy now? I go, inside I was going, yes. <laughs> but but I was also going, I don't want him to be intimidated. I just want him to know that I'm aware of what's going on, that, I, that I'm that i protecting my daughter. I'm looking out for her. Yeah. And if you're taking my daughter out, I'm giving that responsibility to you now. And if something happens to her because of something that you did or didn't do, there's going to be repercussions for that. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my job as a father and a husband is to protect my family. And if I'm giving my little girl away to somebody to take out or to, to go wherever they're going to, um, I would expect nothing less from you to make sure she's safe. Yes. Take her out of a bad environment. Something yes. goes down, she's out of there. Yeah. You take her home. Yeah. <clears throat> you make sure. And the kid brought my daughter home on time. Every time he's brought her home, he's brought her home on time like he's supposed to. He's right a good on. kid. Good. Good kid. Uh, I really like this kid. I Like I said, I haven't really had a chance to have a conversation with him. But, you know, <clears throat> I've got a chance. You know, I've got, I've, I have had an opportunity to experience all this. And so... Behind all these stories is basically, yes, I went through a tough time. 
I went through a tough time as a kid growing up. Uh, yeah, I almost died a bunch of times. And, uh, but you know what? I'm living this really awesome life right now. And I'm experiencing all the things that parents go through, married couples go through, people who, you know, who are working a job go through every day, the emotions, uh, stresses and all the stuff mm -hmm. that they go through. And I couldn't be happier. As much as I tell myself, I can't stand where I work. I can't stand some of the people I work with. I can't, I, you know, I can't <laughs> we, stand. We all go you through know, that. <laughs> I, I can't, oh, I, I'm, I'm pissed at the world for this reason yeah, or that yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy I'm able to experience all that because, you know, there's a chance I wasn't going to be here. So it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you got to look back on that stuff and go, you know what, this, this stuff right here, it's not so bad. You're sweating the small stuff, man. Oh, totally. Yeah, we, we can get hung up on those little things. You know, where there's so many more important than your family, man, that's that's what it's all about. I'm just I want people to know that I'm just a regular guy like anybody else who worked hard to get where he where he was. I mean, I had a dream just like we all did as kids growing yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. And and I didn't wasn't able to realize that dream. But my real dream, which was standing which was gonna be standing right in front of me in a few years, you know, happened. That dream happened. The wow. goals that I set. And what I wanted out of life all happened, John. It all happened. The house, the cars, the wife, the kids, you know, I mean, not all in that order. I mean, obviously, Galit came yeah, first, yeah, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, everything that I wanted, I set those goals. So my message here is just because one dream, one dream gets crushed, you know, so to speak, you know, and I'm, I'm putting it pretty bluntly that one dream gets crushed. It doesn't mean you can't realize another wonderful dream down the road oh yeah it doesn't mean Absolutely. that you can't you can't build this amazing life for yourself um you know by feeling you're not going to be able to build a life for yourself you're going to sit back and feel sorry for yourself and blame the whole world and not get off your ass and go do something about it because it takes effort a good life takes effort it doesn't come huge, to you huge it's <clears throat> hard work every yeah. day on my body when I'm in my fifties, when I'm in my mid fifties or whatever, I'm gonna I'm having a hard time getting around in my late forties. You know, I put my body through a lot. My yeah. body's this body has been through a lot. Yes, all the has. years of working in the grocery industry, all the up and downs and all the work I've been doing, the injuries, not to mention I mean the football injuries, but then the injuries I've had as an adult going yeah, through yeah, all this yeah, stuff, of you course. know. Sure. <clears throat> so, you know, but it's all worth it. You know, I mean, I wouldn't change anything. I mean, because if I would have changed anything, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now. If I would have made one decision different, I wouldn't be sitting here. So mm -hmm. I, I, I have to be thankful for every good thing that comes my way because, you know, am I super rich? No, I'm not rich. You know, but we live a comfortable lifestyle. Uh, would it be nice to be rich? Yeah, it'd be nice, but I don't need it. I, I What I need is health. And a roof over my head, and and to make sure my family is in good shape. You know, I, I definitely need the job. You know, I want to I want to keep working and paying bills like everybody else. I don't want anything handed to me, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I've had plenty. Of, I've got plenty of gifts, gifts that mean more to me than anything monetary. You know, money can only get you so far. It's not going to make you happy. You know, what makes you happy is going home and saying, "Hey, I'm home." Hey, you know, <laughs> or the dogs come running up to you. You know, they're all happy to see you. You know, and. Um, that's what happiness is. You swear, you know, the old saying is, you know, home is where you hang your hat kind right, of deal. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you walk in that door and the dogs are running up to you and they're happy to see you and you're saying hey to the wife and she says hey back to you, you know, kind of thing. And, you know, you're hoping that, you know, the kids are home at some point, you know, and we're down one kid. So it's like, you know, and she's upstairs a lot of times. But, you know, you know, you get what I mean. But you, you come into the house and you're in your safe place. You're in your place where you belong. You feel this is where I'm home. This is where my I I belong. You're out in the world doing other things, working or whatever it is you're doing. You can leave all that and get home because that's your sanctuary. That's where you. That's that's mm -hmm. the place you built mm -hmm. with your partner. That's right. And nothing means more in life than that. Your family is is the pinnacle of your being as a as a man or as a human being. Without that, you know, you live a very lonely um, life, very alone and very uh, with yourself. Some people like being that way. But for me, having people around me is is uh, really important. The people in my core group, yeah, the people that I named off, they're they're in my core. You know, they're mm -hmm. they're ones that I'm still friends with. 
you know, for all these years, 35, 40, 40, almost 50, you know, well, 40 something years, yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, I couldn't ask for anything better. I mean, so yeah. Awesome. I mean, you've overcome so much to get to where you are. And now you're surrounded by people that you love and people that love you, you know, and uh, you have a lot to celebrate. I do. You know, and, and, and the problem with that is, John, is as a human being, a lot of times, often we don't see it. Oh, no. No. Yeah. You, you can get, you can't see the forest or the trees, right? You get caught up in the minutia. You look at the big picture. You don't realize how good life is. Yeah. I, I want 100%. 100%. I'm, I'm living this amazing life. Um, it takes work every day to maintain it. And uh, that's the way it's supposed to, that's by design. You know, if, if you don't hunt, you don't eat. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're right. And you're I, right. I like yeah. to eat, so I'm going to keep hunting. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, I, I couldn't ask for anything anything more. I don't deserve anything more. I, I, I have what I deserve, and uh, what I have is pretty darn good. So Nice. You know. Well, this is all in this book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading this. It be I mean, fun. I, I obviously added some stuff that I didn't put in there. It's a, it's the a heart very, of a lion. A journey back from traumatic brain injury by Michael Ryan. Nice. You can get, it, get it on Amazon. It's on Amazon. It's on Amazon. Yeah, you can get it in okay. Kindle. You can get it in Kindle form, or you Let's can get a hardback. Get this on the uh, on the camera here. So right on. Yeah. This is fantastic. Cordelione. 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 Okay. The heart of the lion. That's awesome. Yeah. So we can get this at Amazon, and um, yeah, I'm looking forward to digging in on this. Yeah, it's like I, I said. I, I didn't know all this about you. I mean, I and this is incredible. I knew you played football. I knew you had an injury. But yeah. I didn't know the extent of it. And I certainly didn't know a lot about your background. I mean, so this has been an interesting conversation. Yeah, and I appreciate you opening your house to me and letting me come over and, and tell my story. And, uh, you know, it's funny is, is I've been wanting to tell the story for so long. And, you know, ironically, Cleet told me she was talking to Cam about it and said you were doing this podcast thing. And I was like, man, this is awesome. <laughs> I, I go, I go, really? I goes, I've done podcasts, but through Spreaker, it was like, you know, off the computer type thing, nothing set up like this. And I love this because I want to do this at home. And, uh, cause this is, this is a start, you know, this is awesome. You, you know, doing interviews and talking with people. And for so long, I wanted to get that story out there. I've told countless people about it. I'm thinking, well, Nina, I need to put it in the book form. Yeah. You should so, write a book, man. You should write a book. So I wrote a book. I just, last year, what was it? No, uh, it was like two years or a year and a half or so ago. I started putting it down on paper. But you know what? This is funny. My, my last guest that was here is Michael Golden. He is also an author. And we talk about how if you publish a book <laughs> that immediately gives you a huge credibility. You yeah. know, it's like you're, you know, it, it gives you a lot of, um, I don't know what the word is, cachet, you know, you know, it, it's you're legit, you know. And so your future, you know, you sort of you want to be do public speaking. You want to be doing podcasting. The fact that you're a published author gives you a big head start. Yeah, I was. You know, like I said before, I would love to put pictures of high school in there, the, some of the girlfriends I had, the, the, the dances, the pictures of when I was in there, yeah. because it shows me before my injury and after my injury, the changes. And then, uh, you know, obviously my wedding pictures and my kids, things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. I didn't get a chance to do that. And that's one of the only regrets I have by publishing this book. You always have a second edition. But like we were talking about, yeah. I can always do a second edition. Yeah. But after people bought the first one, you know, not much has changed as far as the literature is concerned. But, you know, the pictures. Yeah. And that's why I was saying the Heart of the Lion on Facebook. Um, you can go to the Facebook page. And uh, eventually I'm going to post pictures of that. I'm going to scan some pictures in. You know, as a kid growing up, my parents probably. And then, uh, you know, you know, me and my brothers or whatever. Just kind of adding pictures to that. Because people need to see put a face to the name, yeah. you know? So is that the best way that people can get a hold of you is to go through Facebook to the heart of the lion? Yeah. Oh yeah. Or, or, or through my email, you can email me. It's uh, <laughs> lion, Ryan at hotmail.com. Right. So L I O N R Y A N at hotmail. Lion, at right? at hotmail.com. Okay. <clears throat> Obviously. Yeah. And if somebody reaches out to you, you know how to get in contact yeah, yeah, with me. Of course. If somebody were to say, Hey, you know, I'd love to get a hold of Mike and talk to him myself. And you know, and, and I got a kid that is playing football, wants to play football. Or I got a kid that, had, had a head injury in a car accident or something like that, would he be willing to come talk? Absolutely. I would love to go to the hospitals and talk to these parents or, or these family members and say, look, man, I, I went through this. Look, I'm doing okay. Yeah, yeah. 
I'm, doesn't mean that, you know, look, my, my position, my situation is a little different. You know, I mean, I didn't have any brain damage and I wasn't in a car accident. I, I took a bad blow and had a hemorrhage. It's all the same thing, but it's different. You know, I just, I can give you my side, yeah. you know, maybe make, put some, put you at peace, you know, and, and maybe it'll give you some things to think about. And uh, so look, this was a gift. That's the way I, I you know, how, how else can you look at yeah, it? It's, yeah, it's yeah. definitely a gift. Yes. I mean, Look at the relationships I developed. I, I've met some wonderful people in my years, uh, professional athletes, you know, celebrities, you know, not because of this, but because of being the business that I'm in, mm -hmm. you know, I've met them at stores yeah. and uh, wonderful people. I meet people every day, John. My life is awesome. And yeah, Grant, the, the job, the job description, the, the, you know, the career path wasn't, in my opinion, awesome, but... I got awesome experiences from that. Yeah, yeah. and that to me, all what, what you make of it. <clears throat> exactly. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, I'm very thankful. Uh, I thank you, man, for for allowing me to tell my story. Yeah, right. Uh, on. You're number one on the list. I mean, I mean, I had people putting an olive branch out there, but nobody made a commitment. And uh, I'm so glad that you made that commitment to allow me to do this because it means a lot, especially coming from a friend yeah. who opened their house to me and said, yeah, let, let's do this. And, let's do it. And, yeah. and you were able to learn something from me, learn something today. Right on. Every day is a learning experience. Yes, it is. And you mentioned earlier, you're still learning about yourself. Yeah. I'm doing the same thing. Yeah. Learn about myself. They say <clears throat> that's perhaps the biggest challenge in life is to really get to know ourselves. And it takes time, you know? Yeah. And sometimes it takes uh, your partner or people in your life to help you yes. get to know that person. Yes. You know, you have to look, it's like looking in a mirror, but your reflection is the people that are surrounding you and who are in your core group that are telling you, look, this is what we see. That's right. And that's beautiful in a lot of ways. And it, it could be a little bit humbling. Uh, well, very humbling at most, yeah. at most part. People tell you, Look, man, you got some things you need to work on. You really do. <laughs> and the people closest to you yeah. are always the most blunt about what they're going to tell you. And that's good. Oh, it's. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. You can't. You know, it, it's amazing. I have so many friends that it's it's really cool when people tell me what's on there. I mean, my core group is is a smaller group. Most of us in yeah, life have a small oh, yeah. core group, yeah. but I have a lot of friends. But the people in my core group can get away with some of the things that they say. Yeah, of course, right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's 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 all good. I'm I'm living I'm living a great life and I'm very thankful for what I have and uh and I appreciate everybody that's that are that are part of this and I hope this sends a message, a positive message out to people that are interested in and um hopefully this this is uh will kick off some things, you know. Well, Michael, thank you for joining me. Yeah. Um you're my 44th episode on the John yeah. Riley project. This has been great. Um the the book The Heart of the Lion and um, get it on Amazon. You can go to the Heart of the Lion on Facebook. Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Really enjoy it. I appreciate it, it man. All thank right. you. All right, thank you. Thank you. you.